Good afternoon and welcome to the ACCA enrichment session for a paper advanced financial management. I hope all of you are doing well. Now this enrichment session is all about preparing you for um, the upcoming March exam session. Yeah. So if this is your first time um, joining the enrichment session, um, welcome on board. My name is Joanne, uh, the Managing Learning Support for ACCA Malaysia. Um, and it is a very privilege also to have uh, Mr. Alan Lynch, an ACCA tutor guru, together with us here this afternoon. And it's very early in the morning for him though. Okay, Alan, it's uh, on the screen there. That's Alan. Now, before I hand over the session to Alan, just let me run through quickly with you on the housekeeping item. Now, we will be using the chat box to communicate with everyone. So if you have any questions um, to clarify with Alan while he is presenting, just feel free to type them uh, in the chat box yeah, and select send to everyone. Now, Alan will address your questions whenever possible. Otherwise, you can actually save up your questions and ask uh, them to at the end during the Q&A session. All right. So now uh, let's kick start the enrichment session. Now I shall hand over to floor to Alan. Over to you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this session for AFM. Um, now that you're just about two and a half weeks away from your exam, um, this is a really good time to make sure um, that your exam technique, that you're ready for the exam. So up to this date, and maybe even um, even a bit before, you've been working on content, you've been working on trying to go through all the syllabus for AFM, trying to understand all the topics and all the content. And I think certainly if you haven't already, it's now to move into this phase of getting ready for the exam. And I think there are two things about getting ready for an AFM exam. The first one is the practicing the questions and, and having that content. But the most important thing is actually having a strategy for practicing those questions and having a strategy for how you're gonna answer the questions on the day of the exam. And we are gonna go through some comments in a minute from the examiners and um, a copy of the examiner's report will be made available to you today uh, for download or they are available on the ACCA website. But I would really highlight one thing that the examiners have given you a roadmap effectively of how to approach an AFM exam. They have told you things that students have made errors on in the past. And being honest, they continue to make errors on. And every single examiner reports that is, re that is released twice a year comments on the same thing, makes the same points again and again. So I think if you just spend a little bit of time looking at the examiner's report, and I've got to go talk through the main points today before we start on a question. But if you go through the examiner's report, I think it's really key to try and make sure that you don't make those mistakes. So you should be going into your AFM exam and making sure that there's, if there's three or four things that the examiner have said, do not do during the exam, or make sure you do during the exam, you want to make sure that at a minimum, you hit every one of them. Because on the day of the exam, there's nothing you can do about your content. On that day, you know everything you know, whether you know sure of everything, whether you're comfortable with every single possible calculation, whether you know all the theory behind all the content, that's where you are. There's nothing you can do. You can't enhance that knowledge anymore. But what you can do is put your best foot forward and I guess impress the examiner. And if you can do that as well, and you add that to the knowledge that you have, you will have a really good chance of passing this exam. So I, I strongly urge you, especially in the, so what we're going to do today is I'm gonna take you to a presentation. Some of it will be as a reminder of what AFM is, just in case during your study, you got a bit sidetracked and you think it's a bigger thing than it is. Um, we're gonna to go to a reminder of AFM and some of those key points. We'll then, I'll then take you through question one, or a question one, and this is from the most recent September, December paper that was released by ACCA in the middle of January. And in that question one, I'm gonna take you through, I'm going to do it like we're, we're in an exam. I'm gonna cheat a little bit with the, with the, con, with the um, some of the content. So I'm just going to uh, copy in some of the content. But most importantly, I'm gonna take you through the Excel calculation or the, the, the spreadsheet calculations that are needed in AFM. And, and to show you about layout 
and to show you how to best communicate with your examiner on the day. And we'll go through all of the different things. We'll go through all of how you get your requirements, how you build up the requirements from, or how you build up your solutions from the requirements, and then how you actually use um, the tool that you'll be using, your exam tool on the day of the exam. And again, I would stress to you from, if you have been practicing questions on pen and paper up to today, that should end today. So no matter what you did before today, you can change that. But after today, every time you practice a question, it needs to be using an online platform or some description. So you should all have access to the test reach platform through ACCA, the ACCA website. If you don't, or if it's difficult, just use Excel and Word, just use Google Docs and Google Sheets. It doesn't matter, but you need to be practicing every question using a keyboard, using a screen, and never using any, um, never using pen and paper between now and the exam. You have to practice the, the delivery, I guess, of your exam. And that delivery of your exam is actually going to come through. Um, it's going to come online. It's going to come typing. And I promise you, it's not as easy to say that I have um, that I have typed. It's not as easy to say that I can type what I talk because you can't. OK, so now I'm going to that was just a, a I guess, a quick run through what we're going to do today and some of the main points. But I'm going to go through those points now in, in greater detail. As Joanne said, if you have any questions um, and if you if there's any any questions, anything you'd like to talk to me about, please do so. If there are any, um, I'm also asking some poll questions. So I'd like as many as of you as you can, and um, please answer the poll questions as we go through, because I'm interested in what you think and what that helps me do. It helps me kind of get a quick understanding of the group of people that are here today. And that way I can um, turn what I say today towards the experience of the group. And then you'll hopefully get more and more out of that. So, sorry, sorry, Elrin. Yes. Um, your presentation looks like it's not showing, though. I know I haven't started yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, great. Okay. Okay, so you should all be able to see my slides now. And um, that's just what I said, what we're going to be doing today. So my first question, just to get you involved, is do you, do you agree or disagree that AFM is mainly a calculation-based exam? And I'm really happy to see the answers coming through. So 80, around 80% 80 of you, they're still, oh, they're going lower, going lower. Okay, so about 80% of the people on the call today who have answered the question disagree with that and you are right to disagree with that so there can be a bit of a misunderstanding about afm and whether it's a calculation based exam so it is definitely not mainly a calculation based exam in fact i would sometimes argue it's probably 50 50. so those of you who disagree that it's mainly a calculation exam you still might be surprised at the amount of um the amount of narrative or the amount of writing rather than calculations involved so it's generally 50-50. So you should be really careful when you're doing your AFM exam not to spend too much time doing your calculations because you are just losing those time, that time to write your answers. And we'll talk about that as we're going through um, the as we're going through the solutions um, for question one. Okay, so we all know AFM is not easy. Okay, and nobody's trying to suggest that it is, but it could be made so much easier. It really could be made so much easier. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Um, and there is, I guess, what's the reason why it's not easy? Um, the pass rate of 41%, and again, does the pass rate of 41% um, indicate that it's a tough exam? I don't think so. I think pass rates are misleading. I think there's a lot of students who maybe haven't had that opportunity to study really hard leading up to the exam and sometimes take a take a gamble, if, if you want to say that. Um, so what I'd like you to do for my next poll question 
is to answer why do you think are the AFM pass rates so low? So is it that the questions are too hard, time management, or is there other factors in there that, and, and there may be lots in there. So time management. Okay. So again, around that 80% mark um, is 7%. The question's too hard, 10, 12% saying something else, but mainly you're saying 80% is time management. So yes, time management is difficult, but the good news about time management being the issue is the fact that time management is under your control. You were in charge of time management. It is absolutely in your power to fix that. And it's absolutely in your power to fix that today and going forward and being really, really well prepared for your exam. And there's a confusion about time management connected to knowledge and it's not. Time management is connected to the marks offered on your paper. And you have to be really strict with yourself really strong and sometimes on the day of the exam even if you're practicing like this sometimes on the day of the exam it's a bit of nerve and it's a bit of bravery believe it or not so we're going to talk really talk about that but time management comes down to nerve and bravery and organization it's not a sign of knowledge it's, it's not an indicator of any knowledge you have or you don't have so this is really interesting in the most recent, recent report, okay? And we talk about um, AFM being really difficult and lots of, lots of different topics and lots of calculations, lots of difficult theory. Yet this is the main message that the examining team passed on in the recent examiner's report. And that's a copy of the examiner's report that's been made available to you in the chat. Sorry. Bit too early on that one. So the best responses also demonstrate an ability to apply knowledge to the scenario, which is an essential skill at strategic professional stage of ACCA qualification. Applying the knowledge to the scenario. And when you read that examiner's report, you'll find that, and you can feel the frustration of the examiners um, that especially when you're, when you're writing your answers, they're so theory-based. But as we'll see in a minute, and as you're all familiar with, you get quite detailed scenarios with each of the questions. And what they want you to do is they want you to involve that information. They want you to build your answers around that information. They want you to be the, a senior financial expert of those companies. They do not want you to regurgitate the pages and pages of the book that you've learned about this topic. That is one guaranteed way of failing this exam. They want you to be um, nearly integrated into the exam. They want you inside it. They want you inside of the company. They want you sitting in the middle of that boardroom, speaking on behalf of the company that you're answering. And if you can put yourself into that situation, and it's not a big ask, it really is, I, I actually, Think, and we'll talk about it more later on. But actually, if, if you can do that, if you can ensure that you, from all times in your AFM exam, that you have put yourself inside the scenario, that, that your voice is coming from inside that scenario, you will, you will massively increase the chances of you passing this exam. So again, another poll question. Again, this is in practice questions. Oh, sorry, I practice questions within the time limit suggested for an exam. So you're very, you're very strict with yourself and you it's 1.8 marks per minute. So actually it's 1.8 minutes per mark. Apologies, that's my fault for getting that the wrong way around. Um, so it's 1.8 minutes per mark. So you're very good. So 75, 70 odd. So three out of every four of you do not practice. So if you see, and again, you've answered one of your own issues, I guess, here, um, because over 80% of you, a couple of questions ago, said that time management is the biggest issue, yet only 28% of you are practicing time management. And practicing time management, practicing exam technique, and especially at this stage of your study, especially within 
with just less than three weeks. At this day, three weeks, this exam will be over. It is as important, if not more important than the content. So again, we talked earlier about not using pen and paper. We talked earlier about using um, an online portal if possible, or even Excel and Word and not using pen and paper. And this, this is your piece of magic. So this, if you walk out of the exam and you run out of time, you weren't able to answer all the questions. You didn't give every part of the paper a shot. You're hoping that you'll get 50 marks out of 75% of the paper you completed. That's just, you know this. You know that going in, into every exam, this is a situation. So practicing your time management, being really strict and diligent with yourself on the day. If you attempt every single part of every single question on the AFM paper, even if you don't do it all perfectly, even if you attempt every question, you will have a much better chance of passing that exam than trying to answer 75 or 80% of the paper or coming out of the exam saying, I didn't really get a chance to answer question three. That means you have to get 50 out of 75. ACCA is hard to get 50 out of 100. So you have to maximize your chances, but you are in control and you can fix this. So again, it's really interesting how less of you practice time management, but you all know, or a lot of you know that time management is the biggest problem. So a couple of the things here that we have. This is again, back from the examiner. And it's funny because I've used this slide a number of times over for in a number of different, um, different presentations. And, and I update this slide every six months when the examiner is releasing a new examiner report. And it's very interesting that the more and more I use this slide, the less and less I actually change, um, change it. And I don't think I've actually made any changes this time because what they said in the most recent examiner report that you have a copy on is exactly, nearly exactly the same than what they said in the previous examiner reports. And that's not because they didn't get around to it. It's not because they're lazy. It's because students are making the same mistakes over and over again. And those mistakes are contributing to them not passing the exam. And if I had an examiner report, again, what would I be doing? I'd be picking the four or five things that the examiner deemed really important, either approaches or what not to do. And irrelevant of the amount of knowledge that I have, I would make sure, absolutely make sure that I don't do any of that. If they want me to talk about like I'm in the company, even if I don't have all the theoretical knowledge, I'm gonna talk about me being in the company as much as possible. I'm gonna embrace exactly what the examiner is looking for. So what are the few things that they, they mention? Well, financial management matters. And I think you've, you've realized that at this stage by practicing questions and this stage of the content. But question one being 90 minutes. And again, it's an important when you're practicing questions that to allow yourself thinking time and reading time and time to check your answer. But I'm gonna talk about question one in more detail in a few minutes. Use the exam weightings. So when you look at your, for example, in question one, and we look at it soon, when you look at your question one and you see the requirements, and I think a very common um, approach in AFM is to say, I've got 90 minutes for question one. You don't have 90 minutes for question one. If part one of, if the first part of question one is worth 10 marks, you've got 18 minutes. Never look at question one in totality. Never look at it as one, one, big, um, one big question that you have to answer in 90 minutes. It is made up of a group of smaller questions. And even the bigger question in the middle, which will be the calculations and some kind of board report or briefing document or whatever it might be, that can still be broken down further. And you want, to break, you want to break that 90 minutes down into 15 minutes and 18 minutes and 12 minutes or whatever the breakdown of the marks isn't today. 
And that's how you make sure that every part of every question in your exam gets, the, gets at least some good attention and does not get any more attention than it deserves. And that's really important. It's not about being able to have a shot or a go or an attempt for every part of every question. It's actually being able to um, make sure that you have, um, you have given it the attention it deserves and make sure that you're not spending, you're not doing 10 marks of effort for a question that's worth three. Because no matter how good your answer, the examiner cannot give you any more than three marks. So they might look at it and think, wow, that's an amazing answer. I couldn't have written an answer better than that. That's a be the best answer that I've ever seen, but I can only give you three marks. And then they're so disappointed when they get to later in the exam and you haven't had time to finish it. A big thing of, is that students didn't understand the rationale behind calculations. It's very important when you're practicing past paper questions that you understand what you're doing. And there's a really easy way of, of learning calculations, of understanding them. And I think the problem, a big problem with AFM is that you see a, there's a, there's a question later on in the paper that ACCA released on um, forward rate agreements. And sometimes I think students think there's a, I will remember the steps or the processes to answer forward rate agreements, but the scenario can change that process or can, it mightn't always be as straightforward. So you really need to appreciate the logic behind the questions. And the best way of actually doing that is to attempt a, the calculation part of a question, then compare it to the answer, then mark on your question where you went wrong and make all the changes. So if you're using an Excel spreadsheet, go in and say, oh, I should have put that number instead of that number and get your Excel spreadsheet to the right answer. And then the next day or later on that day, do that question again without having the answer. So if you are so sure that you're able to answer the question, if you're so sure you understand now, well, the best way of testing that is to try and answer it again and see if you can get it right the next time. And that's a really good way. And you might think, oh, that won't teach me anything because I'll remember the answer. You won't remember the answer. You'd be surprised that you won't be able to get the answer correct the second time if you struggle the first time. So don't be worrying about trying to practice as many questions as you can. I would say pick the last three exam papers and make sure, first of all, before you go any further, that you can answer all of those questions really well. Um, the people who identified what they call a logical approach, um, and especially throughout the calculations, and hopefully I can introduce you to an approach for question one today. Practicing past questions under exam conditions, and we talked about that especially for time management, you have to practice time management. And again, the best responses demonstrated an ability to apply their knowledge to the scenario. That's such, a, that's such an easy win. So now just again, just to try and gauge um, all of your, your past experiences with AFM, is the, your next exam that you're taking your first attempt, second attempt, uh, second or third attempt, or at least my fourth attempt. Um, Okay, so about two thirds of you doing your first attempt and then others have done at least one before. Okay. Um, I think I'd first talk to the people who have already done this exam and, and they're taking it for at least the, the second time. Um, chances are that a lot of you had mentioned time management. I would say there's probably a link there. So, so please, um, please pay attention to the advice on time management today. Um, Again, those of you who are, so there's about two thirds of you who are taking your first attempt. Again, um, listen today, take this on board. Um, this really works. I think that's everything that we do today really works. Everything we do today, I am, it, this is not about me trying to fix your knowledge gaps. This is about me telling you that from the, that from the perspective of the person who's going to mark your exam paper, if you do it this way, you have got an amazing chance of passing. Okay, now, so 
what are the things to look out for when answering questions? How do people cause themselves issues in an exam? And again, you might, it's funny because if you look at this list, you think, oh, I'd never do that, but everybody does it. And especially those people who are taking the exam for the second time will probably recognize some of these. You should also recognize some of this from previous exams. There's not a lot about AFM that's different. I would say 80 to 90% of the advice that you have here applies to all ACCA exams. And I would also say, don't think that you have to change the approach to get as far as completing AFM, you have most likely have to pass, you've passed other ACCA exams. So you don't start AFM again. Think of all of those, um, all of that positive things that you did in previous ACCA exams that passed them managing your time, making sure you answered all the questions, all of those key things, they still apply to AFM. And if you can keep those basics to help you pass, that helped you pass previous exams, you know, there's no reason why you shouldn't be successful in this. So no marks for mentioning topics. They, you just don't get them. You have to show an understanding. Guessing doesn't work. The examiner is not gonna fall for, for things like that. Um, it just doesn't work. Marking for volume and effort. And you're probably thinking to myself, to yourselves, oh, he's saying the same thing over and over again. And I'm saying the same thing over and over again because students are making the, the same mistakes over and over again. So if at the end of, of, of today, you kind of think that I'm somebody who just went on and on and kept saying the same thing again, um, but you remember, I don't mind you thinking that about me, <laughs> but if it works, if you remember, and like the, the examiners have been saying the same thing for years, years, and it doesn't seem that students are listening. So my job today is to, and, and these are easy solutions. You'll find that none of this really, the examiners don't really criticize the content. When you go through the examiner's report, they might talk about students could have done this slightly better or a lot of students made this mistake. But overall, there's not a feeling that students don't know about AFM. There's just a feeling that they don't know how to communicate AFM. Repeating the scenario or listing the content. And I think um, a common thing is um, students copy in parts from the scenario and they stick it in their answers as if to say, and as if to kind of create bulk in their answers. And if you look at people who get kind of really high marks in the 90s or late 80s, and they get top 10 in the world and all, all of this stuff, I would say on average, their answer papers are much shorter than most other students. Because again, they can only type so fast. They're, they're, they're not likely to be professional typists. But what they have done is they have looked at the requirements. They've answered exactly the question that's asked. They've ticked all these boxes about the examiners and they've ensured that if something, if they have, um, if something's worth five marks, they've ensured they're only spending about eight minutes on it and they've moved on. That's the only way. So yes, they have a lot of base knowledge, but if they had poor exam technique or if they had um, poor time management, there's no guarantee they pass. And then finally, um, sorry. And then finally, oh, where are we? Sorry, I'll jump ahead for me. There's no marks for regurgitating knowledge. So again, don't try and over repeat what's in the, um, what's in your head. Oh. Page 53 of the book had the seven things that were important for this topic. So I'm gonna to write the seven things down, but maybe only one of them was important to the question or the scenario. You give, get marked for a good answer, but not answering the question asked will not give you marks. So even if what you wrote is really impressive, if it's not answering the question, you won't get, again, the examiners might sit there and say, well, if that question was asked, that's an amazing answer, but that's not the questions asked, therefore you won't get any marks. Remember, what you submit in the exam is all the examiner knows about you. They don't know how hard you've studied. They don't know how hard you've worked. 
they don't know the pressure, well, they probably have a feeling about the pressure you're under and the stress you might be under an exam day, but they don't know that. So the only way that you can impress the examiner is what you put into your solutions that day. Always keep that in mind. And always keep in mind, is this good enough? If I was working in a job with a manager or my boss or whoever, if I was presenting to the board, would they be happy with this? And that's the type of standards that you need to hit. So again, a couple of things you should know before attending the exam. You need to know the course. Of course, that's important. Your time management. It's three hours and 15 minutes. It's roughly 1.8 um, eight minutes per mark. Um, that's okay. That's, that's a good bit of time if you manage it properly. And that 1.8 minutes per mark excludes the 15 minutes. So that 15 minutes can be split out for your reading time and planning time. Always be professional. So although there's professional marks in an AFM exam, just always be professional. Be professional for every exam. Put your best foot forward and press the examiner with your professionalism. And then use the available learning resources. And I think between now and the exam, the most important one for you um, is making sure that you're practicing ACCA questions on the right tool and not still using pen and paper. Again, some of these things you probably already know, some of the main areas of the AFM course, and even today, this similar on the question, it's regular questions about company valuation and capital structures and financing and dividend policy decisions. All of those things come up quite regularly. But it's the, it's the way they come up in the scenario they're applied to that makes it very different question by question. Investment appraisal, risk management, hedging, all of that, all of these boxes. And, and I think be careful of chasing like going online and, and finding chat rooms and asking people what might come up on an AFM exam. Everything I've said today will come up on an AFM exam. I'm nearly sure that most of, 90% of all these topics will come up on an AFM exam. And they always come up on an AFM exam. So people who sit back and go, oh, I think an investment project appraisal might come up on an AFM exam. Well, there's nothing to be... Like when you sit in your exam and see it coming up, you shouldn't think back, oh, Alan said that, isn't he amazing? No, because they come up all the time. Be very careful of people who tell you, I know it's going to come up. I know the areas that are going to come up, but there are thousands and thousands of different scenario approaches that an examining team could apply that could change the whole, your whole approach. That could mean that the same topic comes up over and over again, but because the scenarios are so different, it's not really beneficial knowing that. It's knowing that, that these are key areas and you should be familiar with them. But practicing questions will help you do that. So my favorite question um, is, I have taken or plan to take a mock exam. Okay, so in around 75% of you here, three quarters of you have taken a mock exam. That's great. And that's really positive. And that's really important. And I think if you think back to your mock exam, and if you think of the few things that I've said today um, and add those things together, again, what wasn't important in your mock exam was your mark. So in a mock exam, if you failed your mock exam, don't get too worried. If you pass your mock exam, don't get too excited. It's not indicative that you will pass your next exam. It's not indicative that you'll fail your exam because you fail your mock. It's not. The mock exam is all about putting, the mock exam is all about practicing under that time pressure for a continuous period of time. That's really what it's all about, applying your knowledge and seeing how, you, how, how that works for you. Um, there's a couple of uh, questions in here. Actually, I did repeat the scenario in order to illustrate my answer. Yeah, Tanho, never repeat your scenario. It, illustrate your answer by referring to the scenario. So say, as in the scenario, um, we ha you had, uh, you can see the following. So you don't have to repeat the scenario. You have to say, I recommend this decision because in the scenario it says this but you refer to what it says in the scenario, never repeat the scenario, okay? Certainly big chunks of it. So you just refer back to the scenario and say, 
because in the scenario we noted that uh, there were a number of issues on the board, we recommend the following. That's really all that you need to do. And we also, yes, uh, take a mock exam. It's when people say that when you put things in capital letters, you're shouting at them, I would say take mock exam and I'd put that in capital letters and I would shout at you. And if you've taken one already, you still have time to take another one. And, and taking two or three mock exams isn't, um, isn't over the top at all. And again, if you have any more questions, if there's anything you'd like me to talk about, if you'd like anything you'd like you, me to go over while we're doing this, please put questions in and I will keep an eye on them as we go. So what are the other things you should know? Again, identify the verbs in the requirements. So, and you, you know things like assess and evaluate. You're never going to get a question in advanced financial management saying list or so it's never going to be a simple, you never use bullet points, you never, never do things like that. It's always assess or evaluate or discuss. It's always opinion based. Read the question carefully and identify all the requirements. And as we'll say, see today, within one requirement, there's also all re very often multiple tasks. Assign the appropriate time. Again, if it's five marks, it's about eight minutes. If it's 10 marks, it's about 18 minutes or so on. Then answer only what is asked. Don't go beyond. And you have to risk that temptation or, or you have to um, ignore that temptation. So for the last whatever number of weeks and for the next two and a bit weeks, you're gonna be working really hard for AFM. I know that, you know that. You're gonna put your as much inf time and effort and blood, sweat, and tears into your AFM exam. And, and that's different level for everybody, but I'm sure you're all gonna do your best, okay? The temptation on the day of the exam is to show the examiner, look how hard I've worked, because I have all this knowledge. And part of it is on the day of the exam, because, oh, they're only asking this little part, but I know so much, I'm going to tell the examiner everything I know. Now the examiner might be sitting there marking your paper saying, wow, they do know a lot about that. I can't give them any more marks. And now it's a shame they ran out of time. So be really strict with yourself, only answer. There's nothing wrong with not showing the examiner. Do you know that, that answering a question properly, answering only what's asked and, and time management, the examining team get more excitement out of that because you're being professional you're being and they're being listened to. They get more out of that than you showing off all of the knowledge and you not passing your exam. They don't want people to fail exams. I promise you. And, and there's lots of things about ACCA exams and you see people in chat rooms and complaining, oh, ACCA failed people on purpose. They only want to pass so many people. Not at all. Not at all. And when you look at uh, how ACCA mark exams, it's also student based. It's all to maximize and to make sure that every student that deserves to pass an exam will pass the exam. So it's really important that you're giving your examiner every reason to pass your exam. Um, Nanta, is it all right to write the answers in bullet point form? No, never. It is never okay to use bullet points for ACCA answers, never. And I'm going to show you in a few minutes how best to answer questions. But no, you never, ever, there's absolutely no confusion here. You never use bullet point answers in an ACC exam. It's just the absolute no, no. And you'll, when you read the examiner report, they will refer to it. They're every single, if you go, if you picked up any random ACCA applied skills or strategic professional examiner's report, they will, they will mention that somewhere in the exam. Professional approach, having logical arguments, using the information in the scenarios. Remember, there's no um, one correct answer necessarily in some of the discussion questions. So don't say, never think what the examiner. Once you have a valid argument that you have thought through and you've been able to use an example in the scenario to support it, you will get the answers. Again, those four professional marks in the exam. There's a couple of ways of looking at it. Because let's say they usually go for the report in the middle of question one. So there's a couple of ways of looking at those four marks. 
do you just make an extra special effort to be professional and hope to get the marks? I think that's very difficult to do. Why wouldn't you be professional? So I think although the four marks go for the professional marks in question one, there is a sense from the examiners that they want professionalism all the way through. So I think if you can get into a habit of always being professional and remember those four marks are seven minutes. So four professional marks, if you don't think about them, if you're just professional all the time, it means you actually get another seven minutes back because you're not trying to make a special effort for those four marks. And you shouldn't have to make a special effort for those four marks. So you actually save a little bit of time. And there's no doubt about it in my mind, and I think in a lot of other tutors anywhere, if you practice using um, the tool that we're going to use today, or even if it's Word and Excel, no matter what it is that you do, um, you will actually save time. It's much quicker than writing by hand, believe it or not. It is much quicker, it's much neater, it's easier for the examiner, you can be a lot more professional, a lot easier by doing it that way. So what's the professional approach look like? A good answer layout, organized and systematic, a really good straightforward structure, neat and tidy and not crowded. And whatever a pen and paper, when you think you've answered everything, you think of something later and you go back a page and you try and fit an answer in the bottom line and all, I can understand why that happens. Using when you have an unlimited spreadsheet and when you have an unlimited uh, word processor, you should not have a very crowded answer. And again, time management. I always say possibly the most important because sometimes people will argue, but I think you could take that word possibly out of there and be really and actually kind of strongly say if you manage your time management, you're actually in with a good shout of passing your exam. So this is just an example of a very, um, a very simple example. And I wouldn't even worry about it. It's not really necessarily, it's to do with AFM very, very briefly. But don't worry, it's not about the topic. It's about giving an example of what getting two marks does. So you're asked to calculate and analyze the operating profit margin ratio using the data provided in the scenario over a three year period. Okay. One mark available for computation and another one for the analysis. So how do you get two marks? Well, you just show your workings. You do not say, never give a commentary that's obvious. So if you're looking at numbers or if you're comparing two numbers, never say, oh, that was higher than it was last year. That will get you no marks. It's more, it, you will lose professional marks and it's not adding value to your answer. So computing the rate of change or saying why. Oh, the profit margin has uh, increased year on year. And the reason for this is because in the scenario, the company talk about how they save money on expenses or how the revenue has increased or whatever it might be. So always link it back to the scenario. And I, that's a very simple thing. Think about two marks. So when we're doing the questions in a few minutes, the AFM um calculation part is pretty straightforward you get one mark for calculating this rate or that rate or that's reasonably straightforward to follow and reasonably straightforward to judge how many marks you get and we'll go through that but in the narrative in the written answers it's not that easy but what you pretty much can say is that in the report part in the main part of question one every point there's probably a markup for every point that you make every valid point in the other questions and then so for every valid point you make you probably get a mark for every valid point you make and then tie into the case study you probably get two marks so if you're asked in a question explain the four reasons why the company has performed badly this year doesn't matter what it is and if there's eight marks there's two marks per question two marks probably per answer not eight don't try to make eight points, try and make four points. I would generally take all the marks and I would divide them by two and kind of say, well, whatever marks are there, there's roughly, if it's five marks, there's roughly two or three good points will give me, will get me four out of five. If you got four out of five on average right through your exam, you're sitting there with a 75% pass rate and you're very, very happy. So don't overcomplicate it. Think of most of what you say as being two marks per narrative point. One part is what is the answer uh, or what's your point? 
And the second part of that is how is it supported in the scenario? And if you are providing any answers in your AFM exam, that, is, that cannot be or is not supported by the scenario, you are doing something wrong. It's not relevant. So if your answer can't be linked, so if you remember eight points from a book and you're writing them all down and four of them are not applicable to the scenario, you will not get marks for them and you will lose professional marks if they're applicable. So you have to make sure that not only do you write down what your answer is, but it also has to be connected to the scenario. And if it's not, it's probably not relevant for your question. So I know you've asked questions. So if there are any questions so far, please do ask them. And again, ask them at any stage. I get a flashing thing up here every time you guys ask a question. So I will answer it. And again, there's no such thing as a stupid question. There's probably very few questions I haven't heard before. But remember that one question could make all the difference. You could be sitting there, or like I am standing here, um, and you could just be not quite 100% able to connect all of the dots. Just might be something missing. And maybe that one question that you ask is a thing that connects everything, the thing that makes everything make sense. And you kind of go, oh, now I've got it. And what you don't want to do is to be walking out of the exam thinking, I wish I had asked that question now, I wouldn't have made that mistake. So yes, that might happen you coming out of the exam, but don't have a regret that you could have solved that before you went into the exam. So any questions you have, no matter how small they think they are, don't depend or don't hope that somebody else are gonna, is going to ask these questions for you. Um, because that's not going to, what if they don't? What if we're here together for somewhere between three and four hours today and hopefully you can stick with me through it all. Um, but don't, hope, don't walk away thinking after it's all over, I wish I could have asked that question. You can ask any question. I will try my best to give you um, good guidance and the right answer and hopefully I can answer all of your questions. Um, but don't walk away in regret. Don't leave in regret that you didn't ask that question. And I know it sometimes takes a little bit of bravery um, and I know people feel really awkward and you think, well, what will other people think about me and my question? My view would be, I don't, if I pass my ACC exam, I'm not even thinking about what somebody on a webinar months and months beforehand thought about me. I'm actually thinking, wow, I got my, the reward for my bravery and, and, and that's the way you should be looking at it. So please, don't be shy. Don't be afraid of asking any question. And I'm glad there's a few in here and I'll have a look them there. But don't be shy. Be brave about asking questions. Remember, this is about giving you the best opportunity of passing your exam. Okay, This is kind of, I would, it depends on what providers you're with and all of this, this thing. But realistically, this, this, is your, um, this is your launch pad today. This is your launch pad to passing your AFM exam. And it's a really good time to start. Let me... So now that we've said that, I will jump in and have a look at these questions. Um, um, where are we going? Oh, yes. So Ada, any tips on the way to answer on assumptions? Yes, Ada. And we're going to cover that in question one today. Um, again, I think on assumptions, you can get into this um, habits the wrong word you can kind of say oh for net present value i have remembered to 10 different points about assumptions but again it's been able to identify them and match them to the case study but that's actually part of the question we're doing today so we'll cover that in a few minutes is the currency symbol important when doing the calculations in the spreadsheet it may be troublesome to label every numbers no i never use it honestly i, I never use a currency symbol i just don't bother um, I sometimes do, actually that's a lot, I sometimes do, but I don't, I don't, I wouldn't, I, I'll show you, you'll see what I do today. I think it's often easier to write at the top all numbers and dollars or something like that. Um, I wouldn't use the currency symbol. If your answer is clear, you are not getting, um, if your answer is very clear, you are not losing marks because you didn't use the, didn't use the currency symbol. If you get the calculations right, and if you use the right symbols and currencies when you're writing about those numbers in your, in your report, let's say in this case, um, 
no examiner is going to take away points because you didn't use the currency symbol during your calculation. Once your calculation is clear and the examiner is clearly understanding what you're trying to get at, there's no problem. Um, there's a question there about um, people being able to answer. Oh yeah, so just write your questions to everybody because remember you asking questions to everyone. So Chris's question here that I'm gonna answer, everybody can see that. And it means when I'm talking about that question, you all know what I'm talking about and you're all learning from each other. And again, today's a chance to learn from each other as well. Um, Chris, is it advised, oh, your question has just popped off. Is it advisable to answer the written parts first, then the calculation? No, it's advisable to do the other way around. And again, Chris, we'll go through that today. Um, I've seen the cost of capital. Sometimes it is also a risk-free rate, but how do we differentiate them? Well, we're going to do the cost of capital today. Um, and for differentiating them, I think Victor used the approach I'm using today would be the safest bet. Uh, Guillaume, I, Alan, I just want to know when it comes to bond calculation or IOR, is it acceptable to use own calculator and just explain the results by explaining we use our own calculator? No, never use your own calculator and just put an answer in. Okay, it's really important to show your workings in your spreadsheet. And the reason why is that if you put, if you put an answer in, so let's say, I don't know, the answer was 10 million. If you have calculated that on your calculator, like my one, my just in case calculator, if all goes wrong today, at least I can use this. But if you calculate on your calculator, Guillaume, what happened, and you put 10 million in, what if 10 million is wrong? So let's imagine there are eight marks going for your calculation and you put in 10 million and it's wrong. But if actually, if you put in step-by-step, step, if you use the spreadsheet properly and you still got 10 million, well, the examiner can say, oh, look, right in the middle there, there's a small mistake. And the answer was actually 11 million. But you know what, out of the eight marks, you're able to get six and a half or seven out of them. So I would say never use your calculator in that way. I, like, I'm telling you now, I never use calculators doing these. I use everything in the spreadsheet. Um, same goes for the hedging question. Um, the Yeah, I think with the currency symbol, I think, Ada, if you can use the spreadsheet in the same way as I'm going to use it today, I think you'll be fine. And again, this is the way that when the spreadsheets were all introduced, um, I, ACCA have some videos of me doing it. They asked me to do some videos on how best to use the spreadsheet. And um, it, it's how they would be happy, which, believe me, um, um, this will, you're fine if you try and follow the same approach as I use today. Tanho, what the examiner wants to see from our written answers? I know it should be more relevant than linked to the scenario anymore. No, I, Tanho, I think, and if I'm not pronouncing some of these names right, my Irish accent probably ruins them all, so apologies. Um, so the thing about it is, right, but any ACCA exam actually, but it's, and I kind of sometimes think, especially the option ones and AFM, is that there's an over, <clears throat> students don't believe how simple it could be. So when you talk about, I know it should be relevant and linked to the scenario. Is there anything else missing? If you can write an answer that's relevant and linked to the scenario, you're getting 70, 80%. You're not getting 40 or 51. It's kind of that simple because if it's relevant, it meant you have the understanding of realizing what the relevant content is. It meant that the answer that you wrote was actually to answer the problem identified in the scenario and you've linked it back to the scenario. There's, it's actually that simple. And, and I, I don't want to say that AFM is simple or any ACCA exam is simple because it's not. But the process of completing an exam is relatively simple. I guess the, the steps or the rules around completing an ACCA exam are relatively straightforward. They really are. And it's exactly what you wrote there, relevant and linked to the scenario. And if you can come away from every single answer in your AFM exam, you kind of go, well, what I wrote was relevant and what I wrote was always linked to the scenario. Yeah, honestly, the chances are is that you have nothing to, to worry about and you're going to do really, really well in your exam. So don't try and overcomplicate it. I think you should stay away from the internet because there's some very um, 
weird and I sometimes look at chat rooms and I sometimes find discussions about AFM and other ACCA subjects and I'm thinking wow like this is just chaotic but keep it simple and, and I know that's a real old um, maybe an old-fashioned way of looking at it and, and I have done these exams I regularly sit down and do an exam and I'm not saying I get 100% I don't like these exams are difficult but you're not looking to get 100% you're looking to walk out of that exam enough that you think you have a really good chance and there's nothing to be worried about over the next six weeks until you wait for your results. You're looking to walk out of the exam thinking, you know what, I did my best, I tried all the questions. I gave everything a first shot. I managed my time, I was as professional as I could have been and I inserted myself into the scenario every opportunity I could. If you do that, honestly, I would be surprised if you, if you didn't pass your exam. So I think, in behind the calculations and in, between, in behind everything we're gonna look at today, I think you should also remember there's a simplicity because what you're really doing at the end of the day is you're communicating, okay? You're not proving everything that's in your brain about AFM. You're not downloading all your AFM knowledge. You are not regurgitating everything you know. You are communicating with the scenario and Communication is what, really good communication is what will win out at the end of the day. Having the knowledge, yes, but you might only have 60, 70, 80% of the knowledge. You don't have to know every single thing on the syllabus to the nth degree. Nearly accept that you're going to make mistakes because we all make mistakes. Accept on the day that you will not be able to answer everything to the fullest extent, but then you can't use ACCA solutions as a guide either. So, so definitely keep it that simple. And I would take the question mark out of your question, Tan Ho, and I would say there, like make sure it's relevant and make sure it's linked to the scenario and, and you are you are on the right track. You, you just, if you imagine that's just a mantra in your head as you're writing your answer in the back of your mind, you're saying, make sure it's relevant, make sure it's linked to the scenario. Make sure it's relevant, make sure it's linked to the scenario. If you just stick with that mantra, you will, you will have a really good chance of passing the exam. And I, and I actually think you've nailed it really, um, except for the any more part, because it actually doesn't get any more complicated than that. Um, will the examiner click on the Excel cell to see our calculation the formula bar? Should we show the formula in another cell? It's the, I get that question every single time. It's, it's quite an interesting question because, um, um, the whole idea of the spreadsheet is the fact that it makes it easier for you. So anything that you type in, and you'll see me doing it today, and I promise you, I'm not taking any shortcuts. Whatever way I do it today is the exact same way I would recommend that you do it on the day of the exam. But in answer, the examiner can see all of your calculations. So they can click on the cell or they can open them up or they can look at all the formula and they tend to. If you get the answer right, Obviously, they're going to look at it a little bit less, but if you get the answer wrong, what looking in the formula bar does, they try and find out where you've gone wrong and therefore, so they don't overly penalize you. So if it's, again, as I mentioned earlier on, if you've made a number error halfway through, but the process is correct, you will still get a lot of the marks in the exam. So absolutely, don't waste your time trying to over, overly um, put in the formula again. They can absolutely see what's in the Excel file. Okay, now we are going to finally move on to question one. And again, at any point during this question, please um, please ask any questions you can. Sometimes if I'm in the middle of explaining something, I see questions coming in, I will come back to them, but I might kind of interrupt the flow of a certain part of a calculation. Um, but please put every question in and I will refer back to it. And then we'll see what time we have. And what I might do is actually go through um, some of the requirements for question two and three in that exam, just to have a little discussion and a, a preparation uh, for those. But I really want to spend the time on question one. And I really want to spend the time going through, um, I really want to spend the time going through the question on everything and showing you how best to use um, the online tool. So let me just find this and 
Okay, so, so you can all see the exam tool. So this is the test for each tool. If you can't, please shout, but my screen is telling me you can, so hopefully you can. So this is something that you should be familiar, very familiar with and very kindly, and, and I say kindly, not that they shouldn't do it, but they have done it. Um, ACCA ha, on test reach have put up all the September, December exam papers. So I have, you've been provided links today to download the exam papers um, and you get these screenshots like we have here, um, but you have the ability to go on to the test reach system and do these questions. Again, if for some reason that's not available, just use the questions and answers and just use an Excel spreadsheet or a Microsoft Word or whatever the equivalent, but please don't use pen and paper. The first thing before we get into the details of the exam, um, I'd like you to tell, I'm gonna tell you my approach, okay, to this. Now, there's a, there's a couple of things. Um, when you look at the screen, it's the tools that you have available, okay? So let's look up here. And we have symbols and we have highlighting and we have strike throughs and we have a calculator and we have the scratch pad. I am be very honest with you. I never use any of those. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, but the more tools that you use and the more things that you do, the more time that it takes. So it's not about being right or wrong. I, any of the calculations I do, I always do on the spreadsheet you're provided. Remember, anything you put on the scratch pad, the examiner will not see. Your scratch pad gets deleted. So the examiner never sees your scratch pad. So imagine putting a plan for, for a question, especially a narrative question in your scratch pad and saying, oh, there's 10 marks. I'm going to make five points each. I'm going to make a point each in these areas. And then you never get to do it. The examiner never gets to see that. But if that was put into your word processor, it's very different. If it gets into your word processor and you never got a chance to answer it, but your plan was there, the examiner will see that. It might look great, but at least you got some chance of getting the questions. It's personal preference whether you use the highlighting and the strike through and things like that. That's really up to you, I guess. Um, but when it comes to the calculator, I find that using the spreadsheet is better because then the examiner knows everything that you've done. You haven't, you haven't gone over any steps. Um, and it does actually save time after practice. Um, the scratch pad, I would always say how I build up answers is that you start off with your word processor, you put your notes in and you build them again and build them again, build them again. And I'm gonna show you an example of that again. So I'm not telling you you shouldn't use them, but I would say for any tool on any system, just because it's there doesn't mean you should use it, okay? So just be a little bit wary about that. Just because the scratch pad is there doesn't mean you have to use it. You don't have to highlight things. You don't have to strike through. If, you, if it's something that you like doing that you highlight the main areas and then when you know you've addressed them, you put a strike through through them, that's fine. That, that, that's, that's your thing. But that does take that little bit longer. So and, and all I would say is just be aware of that. And doing any exam, any ACC exam is also about efficiency as well. So just be a little bit careful on that. And again, just remember, just because they're there doesn't mean you have to use them, okay? So that's just, the, and again, you need to practice this. You need to practice reading exhibits. You need to practice how best that, that you deal with the information that you're provided. This is all down to you practicing, okay? Now, on the left-hand side, and again, you're probably very familiar, but I think, there's still no harm spending a couple of minutes. You get a number of exhibits. In this case, it's five and you're told you have exhibits here. So what's on this screen is generally just listing what you can see here. So you have five exhibits, you have your requirements, you have your word processor and you have your spreadsheet. And it's an AFM exam. And certainly for question one, we know we're gonna be using word processor and spreadsheet. The biggest danger is doing this. Like, think about it. That's the eight windows you have open. Like, that's, that's not workable. Oh, which one do I have? Or, you know what I mean, you could get into real stress by, by flicking through windows and, well, where's my spreadsheet? I, I can't even open the spreadsheet. It's behind so many, there we go. 
So you really want to avoid this. So what you're looking for is a strategy. And you should have, and you can use that close, when it gets all too much, you can use that close all button. But what you need to have as a strategy is a way of answering questions, a way of preparing yourself to answer the question. I'm going to show you the way that, and I know I've done it for some videos before for ACCA, I'm going to show you my way. And my way is not the only way. It's not the way you have to do it. But I think it is a, an example of broadly you coming up with something. And when you open, see your first exam, your AFM exam, it shouldn't be even, it should be automatically. You should have practiced so many exams for your way. You should have refined it so much that you nearly know, oh, I open up my word processor first and I do this and I put it on this side of the screen and so on. What I try to do is try, and it doesn't always work, but I try to have no more than two windows open at the same time. And that's just really for ease. And it's also for, um, organization and managing your time. Okay. So the first thing that I would do is I find a home for my word processor. So I generally put it over on the right hand side of the screen. And the first thing that I always do is take the requirements and copy the requirements in to my word processor. So you can copy and paste or command C, control C and paste up here, whatever it is. Again, you'll figure out your shortcut to doing that. Now, when you do that, that is one window you never need to open again. Now it does take a little minute to do. So what you, you have to go in and you have to take this again. You have to do a little bit of organization format. Um, so you just have to tidy it up slightly. Just takes a cut. And again, you should be so well practiced in this that you will have, um, that it just comes naturally. That it's just something that you do. And by the time that you're finished, you, don't, you nearly don't realize that you have it done. Now, what that means is that as you're answering the question, you have the requirements right in front of you. So you know, for example, for estimate an appropriate discount rate and the net present value of the project based on all equity finance, for example, this one. So you know that you need to have, to answer everything for B part one, to get those six marks, you need to estimate a discount rate and you need to determine the net present value. So it's very clear then what you have to do. And you need to make sure that each of those parts are answered. But more importantly, you don't have the requirements to deal with. So that's just one window, especially when you have so many exhibits and so many windows to open. Now, this should all be done in the first 60 seconds. It should nearly be the thing you just do first. Find your way, find a way you're gonna use the screen. And, and this is where with practice, using, um, using this system for doing an exam rather than pen and paper will save you so much time. It will be, I promise you, it'll be really helpful, okay? So now you have your requirements. We're gonna go through the requirements. Requirement A is discuss and justify the action Ziki company. So again, you are working for Ziki. You are not a student taking an exam today. You are a professional working for Ziki company. So you are giving all your views and all your opinions have to come from inside of Ziki. It's really important that you automatically nearly transport yourself into this fictional company. So what are the actions they should take to address the three financial strategy policy fa failures? Okay, so you've got eight marks. So chances are one of the, again, we have a marking scheme, but you've no way of telling. But there's three financial strategy policy failures. Uh, probably two of them get two to three marks each. They probably all get two to three marks each. Um, and depending on how well you answer one, one of them might get three and the other two might get two. But again, you could easily, um, three really good points that are all applied to Ziki get you six or seven marks easily. Don't always be trying to push yourself to get to eight. So you got eight marks, you've got roughly about 14 minutes to make 
three or four really, really good points. And again, the important thing is you're going to say three financial strategy policy failures. So somewhere they're going to tell you what those three failures are. So at a minimum, you have to make a really good point over, under each one of those headings. If you do that, you're getting six or seven marks. You're easily doing that in 14 minutes. You've created maybe a little bit of time for yourself. And it's a really nice start to your exam. The second part, very predictably, prepare a report for the board of directors, which part one, estimates an appropriate discount rate to use to determine the net present value of the new project based on all equity finance, six marks. So again, 10 minutes. And this should be the thing that's going through your head much quicker than the way I'm talking through it really slowly, really step by step. But this should happen in, in a minute or two in your exam. Two, estimate the net present value of the new project, assuming that it is all equity finance, nine marks. So again, nine marks, you're probably looking, what, 15 minutes? And again, um, net present value, even if you're not 100% sure you got this right, net present value is you, you're certainly very aware of the years and all the cash flows and, and the years on the right hand side, you should ha certainly have a good idea about how to get as many of those nine marks as possible. Estimate the adjusted present value of the new project, seven marks. Okay, again, 11, 12 minutes. And then finally, the report evaluates whether the new project should be undertaken. And here, here's key, see these bullet points. These bullet points are really important. So you have to evaluate whether the project should be undertaken. That means giving an opinion. Within that, discuss the assumptions made. And we had a question earlier on about how to deal with assumptions. So hopefully answering this question today will help you that. And it pretty much comes up in every question. And the report discusses whether the adjusted present value method will be more appropriate than the conventional net present value method to evaluate a new project. 10 marks. Now, if you think here for part B, the amount of marks of part B, and it's, you're getting this extra four marks. And again, if you're being professional, that's seven minutes you're adding on to your work. Don't think about these professional marks. Be professional from the very beginning. And those four marks are effectively giving you seven minutes back. Okay. So you have those seven minutes back. So we're not going to worry about these four. We're not going to make a specific attempt at being professional. We have been practicing questions up to this date so much that we are just our professional. And we're going to think, brilliant, professional marks. I'd like more, as many marks for professional marks as I could, because once I'm professional all the way through, I get time back. So in theory, you have an extra seven minutes. Okay. 10 marks, 18 minutes. What this is saying is that you have 18 minutes to write your report. And you have, um, there's what, 13, 22 marks, which is about 40 minutes, 38 to 40 minutes to do all your calculations. And that's the way you should be thinking. And then finally, part C, compare and contrast whether Ziki should raise future funding through new debt finance or through asset securitization. So again, think about it. Compare and contrast, it means you have to compare both of them, but you have two areas, new debt finance or asset securitization. So what happens here is that if that's six marks, which is about 10 minutes, you roughly spend about four, four or five minutes talking about new debt finance and four or five minutes talking about asset securitization and how they link together. But what you want to do is say, okay, well, there's two different questions in there or two different requirements in there. So I'm gonna get three marks for each one roughly. So again, if you make three reasonable points about new debt finance and three reasonable points about the relevance of asset securitization, you're easily getting five, if not all six of those marks. But don't be any more complicated than that. And it's really important to do that. I'm gonna use some of the ACCA answers today, but I'm gonna show you a slightly shortened way of doing it as well. Um, and when I take you through some of the answers later on to show you, especially for part C, I'll show you how you can cut that down because sometimes they are a little, they're exaggerated because they're also covering everything on the examining team. So as much as I spend time doing this, you're probably at minute 
three in your exam, okay? Because I am gonna obviously take it step by step and show you as much as I can today. So you've got your word processor set up and you've got all of your, your requirements in your word processor. Okay, now there is a, there is a mixed view on whether or not you should copy each of your exhibits into your word processor. And I would say, even in an exam, it's mixed. So I would say for part A and part C, you do, and for part P, you do, for part B, you don't. And the reason why that is, is there's so much information that it can get mixed up. And I think it's easier to use a spreadsheet and the exhibits, but I'll, I'll show you my, my different ways. So there's not necessarily one right way for every question. There's kind of your way but you have to be a bit flexible while doing those questions, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna concentrate on part A now. We're gonna look at how to put a narrative answer together. We're gonna to look at how to use the word processor effectively. Um, and, but first I'm gonna go through all the exhibits. We'll do part A, then we'll just have a short break for about 15 minutes. And then after that break, we will go into the big part B and the calculations and how you use the spreadsheet most effectively where you show your calculations, all of that type of thing, which is really, really important. And then we we'll go through part C and we we'll see where we are then. Okay, so if you're struggling a little bit for concentration, um, just try and kind of perk yourself up a bit for the next few minutes, um, because this is, a, this is how to use the exhibits. And we're just gonna look at part A, because remember, you don't get this break in an exam. So, you have to be able to keep yourself motivated and how you keep yourself going. But we will, because I'm the one doing most of the talking and listening, it's probably easier to do an exam sometime than listening to me all the time. Um, we'll just do the exhibits in part A and then we will have a short break and then we'll have a really good run at doing part B from start to finish all together. And I think you'll get a lot of benefit out of that. Okay, so let's have a look through the exhibits and the exhibits have to be read. They don't have to be memorized, but they have to be read. And you have to read them well enough that later on you kind of get a real, it, you, you kind of go, I've read that somewhere, I've read that in one of the exhibits. So exhibit number one, and again, remove some of, or use some of these tools. If this comes out as too small, you can make the window bigger. You can do the zoom a bit bigger as well so you can read it. So use your, use these tools and get used to using them. So exhibit number one. Siki Company is a large listed engineering company involved in the development and manufacture of environmentally friendly products for businesses worldwide. That's good to know. It's not hugely important, but good to know. Until a few years ago, the value of its shares had been increasing and it regularly outperformed its rivals. However, more recently, it's been underperforming and many financial analysts are recommending that Ziki shares should be sold. Ziki's investors are becoming increasingly concerned. Well, it wouldn't be an AFM question to tell you that they're all happy. The analysis concluded that this underperformance was due to three policy failures in the company's financial strategy. Remember your requirements. Discuss and justify the actions Ziki should take to address the three financial policy failures. So a lot of the time you will be able to link um, a requirement to an exhibit or an exhibit to a requirement. So clearly exhibit number one is the exhibit for part A. So the three policy failures, Ziki does not undertake post-completion audits. Well, that should spark a few points about post-completion audits. Ziki has used a fixed discount rate of 10% to assess all projects for some years now. And none of the company can remember why, again, you should be reading this, God, this is so straightforward. This is so easy. And Ziki has continually funded new investment projects using equity finance. And the analysis concluded that this financial stra financing strategy sent the wrong signal to investors. So you're, you, you must be reading that now thinking, wow, this is like, really? And so if you think eight marks, I have a heading for post-completion audits. I have a heading for invent my discount rate. And I have a heading for um, using equity finance. And you start off with your three headings. And then underneath you write a few points about each and then you expand them. And then you've got six, seven, eight marks and you've had a wonderful start. And again, I'd be more than happy if my average was out of every eight marks, I was getting six of them. And, and you should be thinking the exact same thing again. 
and also that you're not spending any more than kind of 13, 14 minutes in this. But we will come back to this in a second. So we're happy now, exhibit number one. And to be honest, you might even do this. You can copy some of, so when you're doing it, you have your information here. So here are your three issues. And what you want to make sure is that you're talking about all those three. And we'll come back in a second, but we'll be putting our answer underneath. And so now we're, we're done with exhibit one. We know it's, it's related to part A. We put the main points from the exhibit in here that we have to make sure that we have to talk about. And we move on to the other ones. So again, you can move these over. You can make these bigger. You can increase the zoom, whatever makes it easier for you to read it on the screen. Seeky is considering a new project to manufacture environmentally friendly motor scooters, which are fully carbon neutral. It's a diversification, which they have no previous experience. And again, you should be thinking, well, should that not be higher risk than a business that they have experience in? Ziki's CFO is of the opinion that they should determine an appropriate discount rate for the project based on the initial assumption that it will all be equity financed. Li Yu would be a competitor and it manufactures the scooters as well as equipment for wind farms. Approximately 60% of Li Yu's company's business is manufacturing motor scooters and the remaining 40% is manufacturing wind farm equipment. Then you provided some information about Li Yu, share capital, reserves, market value of equity, market value of debt, equity beta. This should definitely give you some guidance about you should already be thinking what you're moving towards. You're going to be calculating a discount rate. So when you company is involved in the manufacture of equipment for wind farms, it has estimated the cost of equity is 15.4% and is financed 20% by debt and 80% by equity. The estimated risk-free rate is 4.8% and the market risk premium is 8% and the corporation tax rate is 20%. So again, we're already seeing part of, if we look at our requirements here, estimate an appropriate discount rate to determine the net present value. So we're already seeing a big part of that, all answered in exhibit number two. Let's move on to exhibit number three. Ziki expects a new project manufacturing environmental friendly scooters to last for four years. Now, already you're thinking part two, this is my net present value. The project will require an immediate expenditure of 70 million for planted machinery. After the project ends in four years time it is anticipated to be sold for 42 million. Now, again, we're thinking about assumptions should be going to the back of your head. Oh. Like I'm spending 70 million now, but I don't, how do I know it'll be worth 42 million in four years time? So remember the further out, the, the further out it is, the less dependable any assumptions or any forecasts are. So again, you need to be getting into that habit and the more questions you practice and the more answers you review, you'll get in that habit of answering, of thinking like that. Estimating revenue and costs. And again, this is all for your net present value calculation. In the first year, sales are expected to be 10 million and then increase to 40 million in year two. And then in the final two years, sales revenue will grow by 20% each year. And again, that's when the spreadsheet will come into its own and do all the calculations for you. And I would highly recommend you use a spreadsheet for all of this and not your own calculator or even the calculator you provided, um, calculator tool. Costs are estimated at 120% of sales revenue for the first year. 80% of sales revenue for the second year before reducing to 40% for each of the final two years. And again, your spreadsheet will help you out massively in this. Initial working capital of 10 million will be required at the start of year one. Subsequently, working capital of 15% of sales revenue for that year will be required for the start of years two to four. Any remaining working capital will be released at the end of the project. Again, there's a lot of... Um, calculations here and kind of 10% of that and 15% of that and it goes up and goes down. And again, using your spreadsheet will make this a lot easier. Ziki pays corporation tax of 20% every year, payable with a year's time delay, again, for your net present value calculation, and any losses from the project are set against the profits from other projects. Tax allowable depreciation is available on the expenditure in the plant and machinery for the project at an annual rate of 15% on a reducing balance basis. Obviously that's important. It is anticipated that the plant and machinery will have a realizable value of 20 million at the end of the project. 
And this is included in the project's estimated sale price of 42 million. So be careful of double counting. So you're fine now. So you have your discount rate, you have all the information in your exhibits and your net present value and estimate the adjusted present value. So here we are financing for the new project, some additional information. Due to the positive environmental nature of the project, Ziki can obtain the entire funding at a loan at a subsidized rate of 180 basis points, which is 1.8% lower than the estimated risk-free rate of 4.8%, so it's 3%. Ziki's normal borrowing rate is 6%, so it's 50% less than their normal borrowing rate. Ziki has decided the project should be entirely funded through the subsidized loan. Issue costs, which need to be paid, are anticipated to be 3% of the gross finance. Gross, remember that? Issue costs are not allowable as a tax deductible expense. Given that the new project is to be funded by the loan, the CFO is of the opinion that the adjusted present value of the project would be more appropriate than the conventional net present value based on a risk adjusted cost of capital to evaluate the project. However, he cannot explain why this should be the case. So the CFO has a thought that there's certainly probably something at the back of his mind that the adjusted present value is a better approach, but he can't quite remember why. And he's asking you to re basically remind him and tell him. Okay. And then your final one is Ziki's board of directors is considering whether to raise funds for forthcoming projects using new debt finance or through asset securitization. In addition to its manufacturing business, they receive rental income on some of the factory premises and plant and machinery, which is hired to other companies. The board of the direction, the board of directors is of the opinion they should securitize this rental income. So that's all you've got in uh, exhibit number five. And that is clearly related to part C. So we'll put that down there as a reminder. So where are we now? And again, within a couple of minutes of starting your exam, this is all practice. This is all something you should get used to over the next couple of weeks. We have five exhibits. We know exhibit number one is related to part A. We know exhibits two, three, and four are all related to part B. And roughly, broadly speaking, exhibit two is part one, exhibit three is part two, and exhibit four is part three. And then exhibit number five, and then you write your report. And then exhibit number five is all related to part C. So within a couple of minutes, you're actually quite well organized. You have read through the requirements. You've been able to assign the right exhibits. You've read through all the exhibits. They're relatively straightforward. So although five seems a lot, there's not a lot of content in them. In fact, it's a bigger test, the fact of opening, and how do you manage opening and closing them all the time? rather than the content in them, I think, because none of them are content heavy. I think half a page is the longest one, but it's just how you use them. But right now, you started this exam with eight windows. And again, it is all about organization. It's all about professionalism, and it's all about organization and management. So you now, you've looked after your requirements, and you've looked after exhibits number one and five, and everything you need is in your word processor. So after... If you think uh, probably after about five to eight minutes at this situation, you understand your requirements, you understand what's in all the exhibits and you've got your word processor ready to go to answer your question. That's not a bad place to be because then you're in the position that you can start straight away and start answering your question. And that's key. So I'm gonna show you, first of all, how I would go about answering part A. And I'm going to show you a short way, and then I'll show you to, to expand your answers a little bit. Okay, so I'm just going to copy this in because the last thing you want to do is watch me typing for whatever, 10 minutes. So this is where I would start with my summary. Just bear with me for one minute while I just um, tidy this up a little bit, because when you, the one thing is when you copy things in, it doesn't format them as the way you've copied them in. But I do think it is, worth, um, it is worth copying in your requirements and just tidying them up. It will save you, um, it'll save you a, lot of it, a lot of time. So 
So the first thing that I would do is I would start off with my headings. So I would type my three headings in into my answer. So the examiner has asked me to make comments on post-completion audits. They have asked me to make comments on the discount rate, and they have asked me to make comments on new project findings. And that is my starting point. Before I do any comments or before I do any writing, it's first my starting point to say, okay, I'm getting eight marks for this. There are three strip failures. I have to make sure to make a comment under every single one of these three areas. So forget about the text that's in between for now. I need a heading for each area. And that's reminding you, but it's also giving the examiner read. And you don't have to write introduction. You don't have to say, oh, Ziki company have a number of policy failures. I am going to analyze the three policy failures under the following headings. None of that. None of that whatsoever. Exactly what I have here, the three headings. Okay, don't know further than that. It doesn't need an introduction. It doesn't need a conclusion. What it certainly doesn't need is 15 or 20 lines written about post-completion audits. So as part of your answer planning, and this is what I talked about earlier with the scratch pad. Imagine going into the scratch pad and you're gonna go, oh, uh, discount rate. Uh, what do I know about discount rate? Oh, I know it should be, is it fixed? Is that correct? And you do all your plan. All that happens then is that you have to retype it or copy it in here and reformat it. But if you actually build your answer up in the word processor, you're actually answering your question at the same time. And again, as I said, if you do happen to run out of time, like this isn't the perfect answer yet, but if this is what the examiner was faced with, you would get probably four or five, maybe, maybe four of those eight marks available. But if it's in the scratch pad, you'd get nothing. So you start off with your three headings. And then what I've done here is I've done what I, what I would call planning answers. So I said, well, what do I want to say about monitoring or post-completion audits? Well, the first one, it's part of monitoring and appraising projects. It allows you to compare interest and timing versus budget. And it's more, so look at my last point. It's more effective for Ziki in the future. And Ziki will need to ensure they have sufficient resources to undertake the audit. Okay. So I have written here what I would describe as four planning points. Now I would make that, I would probably turn that half of a, if you call it half of a sentence into a sentence that maybe one to two lines each, just to give it some professional. So post-completion orders are a key part of monitoring and appraising capital projects. Um, it is really important that they are, or they are valuable in the fact that you can compare income costs and timing. Um, if Zeke, you're considering the future, it's a much more effective process, but they will need to ensure they have sufficient resources. So just make them into more of a paragraph. I would keep, the, again, there's a qu questions earlier about layout and bullet points. When you make your, your sentences out of this, so this is a long sentence, see the way I have the gap in here? Keep that gap. So it's very clear to the examiner that there's four points or three points or whatever it might be. It's very clear when the examiner is looking at this, there's three or four points, but use the spacing to highlight that, not bullets and not numbering, okay? In a very rare occasion, you might use numbering, but I don't think in any of the question one today, I use any bullets or any number. It's a very rare thing that you would use. So use the spacing available. So see that gap? So the examiner will clearly know that there are four different points. They will open up your answer and see four different points and you will get the benefit there. So don't fall into that trap of numbers and bullets. Never, ever use bullet points in your exam. Use the natural spacing that's created in your word processor. Again, similarly for your fixed discount rate, it can be effective when a decision is made whether to undertake a project. Different projects have different risks, therefore different rates. And, we, and then should consider an overall hurdle rate that accounts for the risk of the project. And in here for your sentence, therefore different rates, unlike Ziki. Even if you write that, therefore you should, I missed my spelling here, therefore you kind of, therefore different rates, unlike Ziki. And again, that's all that you need to tie it back to the scenario. You make a comment, oh, unlike Ziki, they do this. That's all. 
It doesn't have to be a big grand answer. And then the same thing for new project finance, prefer internal funds rather than accessing external markets. So we all know that you use your internal funds first, then you use debt and then you use equity. Debt has tax benefits and then raising equity can reduce the share price. And this is what happened to Ziki. So therefore our final recommendation is that Ziki should go for internal finance, then debt and then equity. Again, I've done this part as a planning type answer and then you build sentences around that. So think about a process for answering a question like this. You look at the requirement. The requirement says three policy failures. What are the three policy failures? You're given them. Post-completion audit, discount rate, and the new project finance. So you start off putting a very clear header for each one. Then underneath, you kind of go, what do I know about post-completion audits and how is it relevant to this? So. I know what they are, so I'm gonna write two lines. I'll just write, oh, a summary of what they are and two or three points that might be related. And you do that under each heading and then you just make proper sentences out. So that should be your steps. First of all, what are the headings required to answer the question? Secondly, put your planning answers underneath each heading. And then finally, write them out in a professional manner, making sure not to use bullet points or numbering and making sure to leave those gaps like I have in between so the examiner can clearly see there are a number of individual points. Now, yes, you have to know your content. So you obviously have to know what a post completion audit is or you have to know some information about your fixed discount rate. Of course, that's important. But it is not, you don't have to know everything. But even if you only had a, even if your interpretation or your, your explanation of post-completion audits wasn't perfect or ideal, but in a way, if you got the spirit of them right and you're able to explain about Ziki and what they need to do in the future, you're still gonna get 70% of the mark for that. So what you don't want to do it's kind of like, oh, I know this. I'm going to spend a really long time trying to really drag it out of my brain. I'm going to take the examiner. Oh, I remember reading it in the book, post-completion audits for two pages. Okay, what were the headings in the book? And then I start putting the headings in the book and I rewrite the two pages in the book. I say, wow, that's an amazing answer. Well, you're still not going to get any more than three marks. So again, just, and even my four heading, my four points here, it's probably more than needed, but it's actually well achievable in the time. But even two or three under each heading, explaining what it is and explaining what, even if you took the simple approach, explaining what it is and explaining how it relates to Ziki in this case, if you did that under each of the heading, you're still getting six or seven out of eight marks and you're done well within the time you've moved on. So that's your strategy. You need to have a strategy when you're answering questions. It's really important. It's really vital to have that strategy and that trust and not trying to get everything 100% right. You do your best that you can in the time that you have available. Is there any questions? Does anybody, um, and we will move on and said, we're gonna have a break there for a little bit, but is there any questions um, that you have on using um, the, the exam tool itself on how you use any of the windows and how we went through the exhibits or the requirements or the approach that I took. Again, it doesn't have to be my approach. You don't have to do exactly. I would definitely reuse this video. I would definitely look back at some of these parts and think, okay, what would I do? What suits me? Um, it might be simple as I'm left-handed, you might be right-handed. I might prefer certain things on one side of the screen. You might prefer them on the other side of the screen. That's fine. There's no right or wrong way. But what you want to do is you want to build up a way that's really efficient for you that you can practice over the next couple of weeks and that it comes to exam day and you're not sitting there thinking about, okay, how will I open all these windows? Because that's just wasting time. So this has to be... It's like if you're driving a car or if you're in a car and somebody's driving and they're talking to you about a, a football match or a, an article in a newspaper, they're driving by um, subconsciously. So you need to be doing this, all, all this part of it nearly, nearly without thinking. It should just be 
should just nearly come naturally. It should just be um, what you do. It should just be a natural step by step before you really start answering your question. Okay. Um, Ada, can we write as simple as that? Yes. So as I said, and I'll show you some, when we look at the, the report, um, the sentences are longer and they're more professional sounding. So as I, as I mentioned in this part A, what I have on screen now, let's say the fixed discount rate, you want to be, you want to make that a proper sentence. Whereas I, I use this as an example of planning points, but yeah, it's that simple. And I think that again, the danger is to overcomplicate advanced financial management and any ACCA exam in that case. Um, and it's not the, put it this way. Imagine you're working and some of you might be working in companies, okay? And um, you're sitting with your boss or you're sitting in a board meeting or a management meeting. And you are asked a question, tell me um, how post-completion audits can benefit our company. You are not going to give them a history of post-completion audits. You're not going to tell them all the advantages and disadvantages, where they started, what the benefits are, all the theory. You're going to say, well, for our company, they will save us money doing this. They'll help us do this. They'll make future projects better. All of that type of thing. And you'll give them such a summary because people will be lost and they won't pay attention anymore. And nearly treat the examiner like your board or like your boss or like your chairperson. And again, the main thing here is that you're inside Ziki. So there are parts about post-completion audits that are not even talked about here from a theory perspective, because there isn't an indication from the scenario that it's important. So again, your question, Ada, can we write as simple as that? Yes. And in fact, the simplest you write, the better the examiner will follow. Arena, what? Which method is the best? Answer the question in sequence, questions one, two, or three, or two and three, and then question one. Um, I would still think answering them in sequence one, two, and three is the best way, Arena. Um, for a couple of reasons. I think the main reason is, and again, this today what we're doing together is a bit exaggerated because I'm 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 talking out loud and I'm taking you through step by step that some that hopefully by your exam will happen just automatically. Um, but there's an some would do some people would say you do question two or three because they're smaller and therefore you can kind of settle in but realistically if you break question one up like i have done and said well this is worth eight marks that's worth nine marks and you break them up as individual tasks it makes no difference i think that there's no doubt about it and you all know this from doing previous exams three hours and 15 minutes is a long time to be fully concentrated and I'm sure even in the last few minutes while you've been listening to me you're you might be struggling a little bit to keep up with everything because it's a long time concentrating and therefore I do think there's a there's an element of let's call it relief about getting question one I think credit question two and three because the companies are different and because the scenarios are different it's kind of refocusing your mind it's like a fresh start and I think if you did question two or three first, and then it was the second part of the exam or the last 90 minutes that you were spending on question one, you've used some of those reserves, and then you feel like there's a, there's a whole mountain. So um, it's like what I, I tell my kids when they get uh, schoolwork at home or homework to do, um, always pick your worst subject first. So when you're a little bit tired, at least you're doing your favorite subject. So in, in, in that same way, I think I would always start with question one first and just do two or three because it's another thing to answer in the exam. It's another question. It's another thing to think about. Whereas if you just know you're going to do the exam in the order given to you, it's something you don't have to think about. So think of that valuable time. You might spend five minutes reading all the questions, trying to decide whether to do question two or three first. And that five minutes could make all the difference. That five minutes could be the difference between answering a part and post-completion audit well or not, which means it could be a difference between 48% and 52%. So I wouldn't, what you want to do is you want to give yourself as little to think about on the day of the exam. 
give yourself as few decisions as possible so that all your focus and all your energy goes into answering what the examiner is looking for. So in, to that end, I would just do one, two, and three. And that. that's the, the long answer to a short answer, which is what you probably wanted, is just do them in order. Okay, if there's no more questions, what we will do, we will have a, a bit of a break so you can go off and stretch, go for a walk, drink coffee, whatever it is to kind of get yourself refocused. Um, because the next, um, the next time that we, when we come back, we will be doing part B of question one, which is obviously the big chunk of it. And it's obviously a really important one because it's managing those calculations, it's using the spreadsheet, and it's building a report um, in your word processor. Um, and again, hitting that professional mark. So it's a good way of, of um, learning. It's really important that you pay really close attention to that part. Um, I want you to ask as many questions as you want. If you see me doing something on a spreadsheet and you kind of think, are you sure you want to do that way? Or why are you doing it that way? Not necessarily about the calculations. Don't worry too much about the calculations because this isn't necessary a lecture on the calculations today. This is actually us all working together to find the best way, most efficient way of, your, of answering a question on the day of your exam, of improving your exam technique. So of course, if you have a question and kind of say, why did you multiply that number by that number? I will answer that. But actually just step back and look at it slightly more strategically and look at it from an exam perspective come back later on and practice this question again and you have all the solutions and and, lo and that way you can kind of get really into why did I take that rate multiply by that rate I'm not saying you can't answer that but that should be secondary what you should be looking at oh I didn't know you could use a spreadsheet like that or that's a much nicer way of using the spreadsheet or that's how you, you use the spreadsheet versus the uh, word processor okay so try and take from that perspective you can come back again and look at the the question in detail and the actual calculation in the subject matter, but it's kind of the use of the spreadsheet and how you how you use the spreadsheet and the word processor at the same time to maximize your professionalism, to maximize your marks and to impress the examiner as much as possible. Hopefully get that out of this today first, and then you can come back and do all the other stuff. Okay, so let's take, um, so I, I, honest, I realize I've given you a lot of information. So, I get completely, so let's come back in 20, when the clock hits 40. So it's 8.20 a.m. for me, or near just, just before 8.20 a.m. for me, which I think is at 4.20 for you in the afternoon, but it's something 20. Um, it's a bit early for me for the time difference. So um, let's come back in 20 minutes. So when your clock hits 40, I'm just going to get started. Um, I'm going to be starting on part B, which is the calculation question. Okay, so we'll see you in 20 minutes. Okay, welcome back everybody. Um, so hopefully you had a bit of a refreshing break where you stretched the limbs and stretched the body and woke up the brain a little bit. Um, and again, I know we've covered an awful lot of information today on some of the, um, the links that you've been provided for downloads, you should definitely do that and definitely to read the examiner's report and use this video again. Um, to look through the question and make your notes or do whatever, but um, really important. Um, you'll get some real value um, if we can just stick with me now for the next less than two hours. Um, and if you can stick with me for that, uh, as we go through using the spreadsheet and the word processor in more detail and answering this number one question. And again, all of the tools that we're using for this number one question, you can apply them all for questions two and three as applicable. So it's the exact same approach. There's not an approach for question one, and then two and three are different. It's the exact same approach, just obviously smaller because there's a smaller amount of marks. Okay, so again, if you have any questions, please put them in as we go. I will get to them. If I'm in the middle of explaining something, I'll come back to it, but I'll definitely get to them. So if there's any questions you have. Um, but for the next while, we're going to really concentrate on doing using the spreadsheet. I have not pre... Um, pre-populated anything in the spreadsheet. I've not got anything ready. I'm going to do this question from scratch. So you can see all the little things I do. And sometimes it's 
sometimes uh, it's not that I'll explain every little single thing I do. Sometimes you might just watch me do things. You go, oh yeah, I can see how he's doing that. If it's not clear, do ask some questions. But it is a, it is a way of just showing you how you build up an answer in the spreadsheet. Two things that to be aware of before we get started, and it's what the word processor does and the spreadsheet does. So what you should never do, you should, you should never do complicated calculations in the word processor. Okay, it's difficult for the examiner to follow. It's too hard to format. It just doesn't work. You don't get the benefit of the calculations being checked for you. And remember, that's what the spreadsheet does. It actually does the calculations for you. So it doesn't mean that you'll get that, um, hit that number wrong in your calculator. And in the same way, you should never, ever type long sentences in your spreadsheet. Even if it's a case that most of the marks for a part of a question are for the calculations, and then you have to write two or three sentences as a summary related to that, always put those two or three sentences in the word processor. The examiner will open them both. What you have to make sure that you do is just you have to reference them properly. But so never use the spreadsheet to write long sentences and never use the word processor to do complicated or really do any calculations. And if you can avoid those two things, I think you'd be fine as well. So now we're gonna move on to B. And again, it's the report for the board of directors. Somebody asked a question earlier, do you do the writing first and do the calculations? What I'm going to do is I'm going to do, and look at how it's asked. All the calculations are asked first, and then the project, the board. Now, sometimes it's the other way around, but I would always do all of the calculations first, and then I would go and I would do the board report second. So that, that would be my preference. And I think that's the way I would always recommend is get all the calculations done as much as possible first. You may find that when you're doing the report, you kind of, oh, I didn't quite do that calculation properly, or you can find an error, you can go back and fix it, but certainly do as many of the calculations as possible first, and then you do your report. And I think that's definitely the best order to do that in. But in this question, if you even follow the way the requirements are set out, there's a calculation for parts one, two, and three, roughly aligned with two, three, and four number exhibits. And then the port, part four is all about the report and talking about the assumptions and things like that. Okay, so again, as many questions as you want, just throw them in there and I will get to them. I will answer or attempt to answer every single question that you have this morning. So let's, first of all, we look at our spreadsheet and we can we can assign that a size. I would always keep the spreadsheet on the other side of the word processor because although it doesn't matter right now, what will happen is that later on when we're doing a report, it's really useful to have the spreadsheet and the word processor open at the same time so you can take the numbers. So, oh, our discount rate is X. And you don't have to keep opening and closing them or moving them around. So generally, I would always have it that my spreadsheet opens and my word processor opens and that I can use both of them at the exact same time. And that's useful, I think, for later questions when you're practicing question two and three. I think it's question two in this paper. It's actually where it's, it, there's a little bit more to and fro from one to the other, and therefore it's really useful. So that would be my, my first piece of advice. Because if you close down your word processor, you can open this all up. And when you reopen it again, it'll open up. So once you've sized it, and close it down, it'll reopen in exactly where you left it, okay? So you don't actually need the word processor for the time being, because we're just gonna do all the calculations. What you don't have to do also is you don't have to write the answer for part one, part two, part three down here at all. That's not something you ever have to do. So what we're gonna do is gonna do this, and we're going to open up our, um, our exhibit here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep our exhibits close to our um, close to our spreadsheet. A really important thing to do is always make sure that you're putting a header on your spreadsheet, that it's very clear from the examiner's perspective what it is exactly that you're talking about, because that, that is really important. So and when I talk, when I mean that, so what are these? Well, these are appendices. These are the appendices for your report. Again, you can widen columns very easily like that. You can bold them, you can underline them. Again, talking earlier on about the different tools that were available as part of 
like your strike through and your calculator and things like that. You have a lot of tools available here where you can use shading and different colors. I tend not to do that. I tend to use bold and underline. And I think a very simple structured layout with just some bolding and underlining as much to highlight to you as the examiner what the final answer is. So it's useful to access later on when you're writing your report. I don't think I'd go down as far as using um, colors, shading and all that type of thing. I'm not too sure there's really value in that. And again, it just takes time. So what are we doing first? Well, the first one we're doing is Appendix 1. And what are we? what is Appendix 1? Well, Appendix 1 is B, Part 1, just as a reference, OK? So our Appendix 1 is B, Part 1, and B, Part 1 um, from our um, requirements that we looked at earlier. And what is B, Part 1 doing? Well, we're estimating the discount rate. Now, again, just be a little bit careful about the, make sure all these spreadsheets are um, wide enough that the examiner can read everything. That, that's quite important. Sometimes you'll need to find a little bit more room for your spreadsheet, depending on how many columns there are, but that's okay. You can do that and overlap them. That, that's something you'll get used to doing. So the first thing that we're doing is estimating the discount rate. So the examiner is very clear. And again, you'll be able to refer to Appendix 1 when you're doing um, your report and it'll just come across again that professionalism will come across much easier again don't be afraid to leave a line don't be afraid to leave a gap it doesn't have to be um, everything filled in every line used make it much easier for make it much easier for the examiner to to go through everything so the first thing that we're going to look at is the EU company and we're going to look at their asset data because obviously we need this as the first step now, for the asset beta, we know later on that we're going to be using six columns, which will be those columns there. We can give them a little bit of extra width. Um, now, for the asset beta, you do not have to write everything out in great detail. And it really is much more beneficial if you practice using the spreadsheet and do everything in. Because remember, as I said earlier, the examiner, when they're marking it, will be able to see everything written in your formula. So what are we looking at here? Well, first of all, the equity beta of Li Yu company is 1.2. So everything starts off with an equals. And we're going to start off with a 1.2 or 1.20. Now we're going to multiply that. And we're going to multiply that by 172 million. Now, I'll show you in a second a little bit of short way, but we're going to look at the numbers in millions for now. And I'm going to show you a way of when is applicable, but obviously the asset beta is a is a number rather than millions. Okay, so 172 million. And be careful; it's it's going to be very finicky when you touch your mouse, and it'll pop off here. So just get used to that, and and certainly don't panic. Don't panic if your spreadsheet's not working properly. If there's a little bit of delay, just take your time, do it properly, and you'll be fine. So what are we going to divide that for? Well, we have to. It's the equity divided by the debt and equity. Again, yet get used to where you put your um, get used to where you put your brackets. So it's divided by 172 million. Sorry, speaking of brackets, divided by 172 million plus our debt, and our debt there is 48.26 million. But remember that our um, tax rate is 20%. So we want to multiply that by 0.8 because obviously it's the equity divided by equity plus debt, but the debt has the tax benefit of 20%. So again, that, that came out, if we undo that again, that came out as a very oh, long answer. So you can put it in here so you can see that number came as a very long answer. So this number formatting, I would generally either, depending on the number, I would generally do it to two decimal places or no decimal places, but you certainly don't need it. I know an ACCA exam just see one decimal place. When you're using the spreadsheet, I wouldn't do that. So I would do it to two decimal places and you have your asset beta at 0.98. Something to note 
that effectively the ACCA solutions were done nearly by paper and pen and stage by stage. So they're going to use the acid beta, beta of 0 0.98. But the actual acid beta is going to be a lot more decimal places because you're using the spreadsheet to calculate it. And therefore, the answers will be slightly different. The, the broad overall end answer will be exactly the same, but numbers wise, there'll be a slight difference between the ACCA solution than this solution today because we're using the exact numbers from the spreadsheet in exactly the same way we do it on the day of the exam. But acid beta is 0.98, but because we're going to be linking ourselves rather than just typing in 0.98, you're going to get a slightly different answer, but broadly the same. So we've calculated the acid beta as Li Yu company, and we're effectively going to use that as a proxy. Okay. Now the next we have to do is Sam Wen Yu. The other thing is about, and, and this includes your report and on your Excel spreadsheet. You do not lose marks for spelling and you don't even lose marks for poor writing, although you want your writing to be as good as possible. Where you lose marks is if the examiner can't follow your writing or can't understand. So if you don't spell San when you write, I'm not even 100% sure I'm spelling it right here. I think I am. But even if you don't spell that correctly, they'll clearly know what company you're talking about. But if it makes no sense whatsoever, that's where they struggle to give you marks. Okay. So now we're going to calculate the equity beta for San Wenyu. And again, what do we know here? Well, we have the cost of equity. So again, you're starting off every formula with an equals. And we're starting off with 15.4%, which is the cost of equity. Again, all of the, a lot of these numbers are actually given to you. So once you know your theory, you can really piece it all together. And what you're doing is you're from that cost of equity, you're taking away 4.8%, and the 4.8% is the risk-free rate. And we're dividing that by 8%. And why, why do we divide that by 8%? Well, 8% is the risk premium. So let me just, sorry, put out my beta in there. So it's equity beta. So our equity beta is 1.325. Okay, then we look at our acid beta. And how do we calculate our acid beta? Well, now again, this is the power of the spreadsheet. So obviously you can use your equity beta to calculate your acid beta. There's a couple of ways to do that. You can go in and go 1.325. Now, the difficulty about, not the difficulty, the negative thing about typing in an answer from the cell before is that Let's imagine that later on you look at your equity beta and you go, oh, I made a mistake. And that should have been, I don't know, 14.4 instead of 15.4%. If you then use that number manually in later cells, you have to check all the cells and change it. But if you link the cells together, it means if you correct something in here, it'll correct it in the whole calculation. So for example, when you're calculating the acid beta, I would click on that number. So link it to your calculation. So if your calculation is incorrect, then later on, if you do notice the error, that means that um, you can fix it. That is perfectly fine from an examiner perspective. They will see your formula. They will see that you've added in your equity beta. You don't have to type in the number. So there's absolutely no issue with that. You multiply your equity beta by 0.8, which is the tax-free, or sorry, it's the, uh, sorry, the 0.8, is the um, tax free rate for the tax, 100% um, minus the 20% corporation tax, divided by the 0 0.8 plus the 0.2 by 0.8. And again, all those numbers are given. So look below, the cost of equity is 15.4%. It's financed 20% by debt and 80% by equity. So the 0 0.8 is the equity, the 0 0.2 is the debt multiplied by 80%, and the 80% is representative of the after-tax event. Okay. And again, you might come up, but you can format your number here, and you're coming up at 1.1. Okay. So now you have, you've looked at Li Yu, you've got your asset beta, you got your equity beta and you got your asset beta for San, so for San Wenyu. Now, 
uh, the acid data for motor scooters. So remember you're told, or scotters rather than scooters, you are told, but again, I'm just correcting that automatically, but you really don't have, the examiner will have no problem understanding what that is. Now, the reason why that is, is because remember you were told that there's a mixture of motor scooters and another product that they use for the wind farms, and therefore the acid beta is made up of both of those. So what is this? Well, now this is where you really have to know your calculations, okay? And we're just gonna put it over here because we just have, for this one, we have all our calculations in, um, in here. But if we actually type this out just to show you, okay. So the 0 0.98 is the acid beta, okay? And what do we know that that's equal to? Well, we know it's equal to the 0 0.6 and the 0 0.6, again, it's all in this, all in this exhibit. All the information is provided to you. You just need to spend a little bit of time and take your time finding it. So approximately 60% of the business is manufacturing motor scooters and the remaining 40% is manufacturing wind farms. So what you're looking for is taking that 60% chunk, okay, multiplied by the acid beta for scooters, which we don't know yet, okay, plus, and what are we taking there? The 0 0.4, which is the 40%, multiplied by 1.1, which is the acid beta, okay? So we know what the acid beta is for Li Yu, and we know that that is the same as the 0 0.6 multiplied by the acid beta for scooters, plus 0 0.4, by the acid beta, which is 1.1. So what the unknown part of this one is the acid beta for scooters, okay? Now, the, so that's what we're missing. So that's your formula, okay? Now, remember, we have to rework that formula that's the, that the acid beta for scooters is on one side of the calculation and all of the numbers are on the other side. I, if this is not really making sense now, I think you're better off taking this solution later on and just looking at it and just working through the mathematical formula really and how the mathematics works rather than it's not about acid beta, it's about calculations and just give yourself a little bit of time. But this formula that I'm on now is the same as what we're trying to find out is the acid beta of scooters. Remember that's our aim here. So how do we turn this formula here into the acid beta for scooters? Well, equal to the 0.98, okay, minus 0.4 multiplied by 1.1, which is four, which, which is 0.44, okay. divided by 0 0.6, which is the amount of the business that's manufacturing motor scooters. Again, if you format that number, two decimal places, you should get, oh, I have done something wrong here. We should get 0 0.9, not nine. No, just bear with me for one second. Oh, I know what I've done. Where? Oh, apologies. Extra zero here. Again, be careful of your typos. But again, if you notice that a little bit later instead, that's fine. And obviously the acid beta wouldn't be nine. So that's just a typo issue on my part. And again, these things are going to happen. It looks, I've already done this question a number of times and I'm still doing typos. So they will happen. Don't panic. Just make sure to check your answers all the time. So now you got your acid beta of 0.9. Now we're looking at the base discount rate. Now, obviously you're gonna use this discount rate for your future net present value calculation. So what is your base discount rate? Well, how, first of all, we start with the 4.8%. Why the 4.8%? The 4.8% is the risk-free rate. We are adding 8%, which is the risk premium. 
and this 8% risk premium is going to be multiplied by the 0 0.9, which is the acid beta for scooters. Again, formatting your number, giving you 0 0.12, or if you use the percentage sign up here, and you can use as many decimal places as you want, is 12%. So now you know that your base discount rate that you're going to use is 12%. So really take this answer and follow through the logic a little bit later on, take, take the numbers from, but as you can see, all of the numbers come from the exhibit. You just have to be familiar about how you take them from the exhibit and make them a part of a logical answer in, in the calculation. As I said here, if you gave the examiner this answer, you will get full marks. Everything within the cells, they will know. This is just for logic, really. You don't even have to write that down if you just did that part, yes. But actually, some parts is actually good to write down the logic and then rearrange the formula. But again, an answer like this would get full marks in the exam and the examiner can go and see every single calculation that you write. And when you're linking that, in this case, to B14, they will see that calculation and they'll know exactly what you're linking to. Okay. So now you have your base discount rate. And again, just because it's a total or because it's an answer, you can bold it or underline it. It is not professional to put things, lots of things in red or shade lots of things. This is perfect. Your examiner will, believe me, your examiner will be very happy with you here. Okay. So now we're going to move to Appendix 2. And what is Appendix 2? Well, Appendix 2 is B, Part 2 because that's the part, the requirement that we're answering here. And then we are looking at the motor project. That was all equity. And again, a nice little heading up here. So that's what we're trying to, to find out here. Okay, so this is our net present value calculation. So we don't really need this. We might need some of the information later on, but we don't really need this for now, but we can go down here and open up exhibit number three, and we can just make this neatly fit in the window that we want. And again, this is all of our sales information that we're going to need for our calculation. So again, having that right beside you, you don't need your word processor, you don't need every exhibit open, just one at a time and work your way through it, okay? So now we're doing our calculation. So what do we have? We should obviously have a basis for what we do for our net present value calculation. So first of all, we know we have five years from reading and we have year zero. So we have six columns. And we know that um, from some of the calculations. Why do we have five years? Because if they say it's a four year project, well, the main reason is because tax is paid a year in, a year in arrears. So if your business is closing down, if this is closing down or ending at the end of year four, there will be a tax payment to make at the end of year five, which needs to be included as well. And again, somebody asked me earlier about um, putting the dollar signs and stuff like that. I think I would do exactly what you would generally do in an answer like this. I would do dollar millions up here. So then you only have numbers because otherwise the columns get very crowded and get very untidy looking. I would bold them, I would justify all the cells. I would really just very quickly make it look very neat, very tidy, very presentable, and very easy for the examiners to follow. So now we're working on our net present value calculation and no surprise that we start with our sales revenue first. So what is our sale? What do we know about our sales revenue? Well, in the first bullet point in the exhibit, right beside your answer, everything's so easily at hand. Um, our sales revenue is expected to be 10 million in the first year. So we know it's 10 million. Now, what we can do here is we know we're going to need a lot of space for some of these numbers and we can format them now. So there's a choice whether you want to format them for one, for D, for if you want to do two decimal places or no decimal places and they'll all be formatted in the same way and the calculations will look so much easier. Or you can use, so um, it's a preference. I don't really, let's do two decimal places because there's room. If the cells are just getting a little bit too big, we can, we can always reduce that. But let's use two decimal places now. So we know the sales in year one are 10 million. 
we know they increased to 40 million in year two. In the final two years of the project, sales revenue will grow by 20% each year. So we take start over our equals, we take our 40 million and we multiply that by 1.2, or you can multiply by 120%. So year two is up, so that's 48 million. And then if you drag that formula over to here, it's 57.6 million because that's taking the 48 million multiplied by year two. So again, the spreadsheet is much easier. So that's your sales revenue. The next one, obviously, if we have is our costs. And what are our costs? Costs are estimated at 120% of the sales revenue for the first year, 80 for the second year, and 40 for each of the two final years. So we're going to start off with our equals. We're going to take that and we're going to multiply that by 1.2 or 120%. Now, the reason for that, using the formula, what you can do now is your formula is correct. You can drag that across. In year two, we just change that to 0 0.8. In year three, it's 0 0.4. And actually, it's 0 0.4 for year four as well. So you're just copying over the formulas. Okay. Now, again, you can, I should have done that at the beginning, but you put a minus in front of each of the formulas. You can also leave the positive and just do one minus the other, but I think in a net present value calculation, it looks neater when there's negatives in there. Okay. So now you have your sales revenue and you have your costs. And now we have our cash flow before tax. And what is our cash flow before tax? So it is equals to 10 million plus our negative 12 million, which is a minus 2 million. And again, we can drag that all the way across. Okay, now what else do we have? Well, we have taxation. We know taxation because we have um, the tax allowable depreciation. We know the taxation is going to be something later on. So we're going to put that in as working one and we'll come back to fill in the taxation. The next one we have directly from our question is our investment. Now, again, if you wanted to come back, if you want to do taxation and then come back, you can. I just find it neater that you complete your net present value calculation and then you can feed in your numbers later. What do we know about our investment? Well, again, we are investing, investing 70 million in year zero or today. And we are also due at the end of year four, we are going to receive 42 million back. All from the question. And then again, this cash flow before tax, I just like bolding these. I think it's nice to have just some natural breaks. Then the investment, we have our working capital. And we know our working capital is the number of percentages that we have to work out. So we'll make that working number two. And on working number two, we'll come back and we'll fix that a little bit later. But we can still go and do our cash flows. Because what do we know are our cash flows? Well, our cash flows are going to be equal to the sum of those, those cells added together. Now, because we put in a formula, when we put in our taxation and when we put in our working capital, those numbers will change in a few minutes. See, so we have a question. Can we use bracket sign as this, this deduction instead of negative sign? Um, yes, Rachel, you can use whatever you want. Um, negative is easier for doing your calculations, but whatever one that you choose, it makes absolutely no difference. Um, in a funny way, once you get the right answer at the end, it's okay. So even if you didn't use, you could use all positives and just make sure it's one minus the other, but the minuses or brackets are perfectly fine, yep. So we'll come back and we'll insert the taxation later and the working capital later. But again, you're just picking up more marks. You're picking up the easy marks here because we know what your cash flows. We know what your discount rate. Now, what's your discount rate? Well, your discount rate is 12% because you've calculated your discount rate above. You have a copy of down below here, you have a copy of your um, discount tables. So we know year one, and again, I just have them here, but you'll be able to find them 797.712. 0.636 and 0.567. So there are the discount rates for each year. 
again, it's fine showing one decimal place. I know they're used to showing two or three, but it really makes no difference. The examiner can see them. It doesn't affect your calculations. So I wouldn't bother adding more distance. And then the present value of cash flows, again, is your, is your cash flow multiplied by your discount rate. And again, you can copy all that across. And again, we know they're gonna change quite dramatically when we add the rest of them. And then what is our overall present value? Well, our overall present value is the sum of these guys, which again is not the right answer for now. And we know that, but that will update. So now we have our present value calculation. Certainly the template completed, we know what we're missing and we can start working on them now. But again, you're already picked up a lot of those marks from what you've put in already. So even if you get tax completely wrong, even if you get working capital completely wrong, doesn't matter because you've picked up a lot of these marks. The, the issue is if people start on their workings and don't have this nice, this calculation ready, you start on the workings, you can get so distracted by the workings, you forget to pick up the easy marks. And these are the easy marks because these are all of the information that's provided to you um, in the exhibit. And again, if you remember the old ACCA exams for, for AFM, it used to be all of these just used to be in long pages and you're trying to find out which part of um, the case or the scenario is related to which part of the question. It's so easy now because you can just line them up exactly like we have here today. Okay, so let's have a look at our, um, the two gaps that we have. First of all, our working one. And our working one, we have said that's our taxation. So let's get that one done first and see where we end up with that. So what happens with our, what's, what's happening with our taxation? Well, the first of all, we need to look at our year and then we have tax allowable depreciation. And then obviously we have our working balance here. And again, you can put your dollar millions to make it a little bit easier and clearer. And that way there's no doubt um, you can use underline, you can use bold, you can use any, any way you, you wish to, to do those headings. It really, it kind of really doesn't make a difference. Try and aim for a little bit of consistency throughout if you can. Um, but once it's very clear, you'll see here that I leave the gaps in between. Um, all the gaps are left in between. It, it is really, I think, pretty obvious how it, how it all works. And it's very neat and tidy. So our tax allowable depreciation, what do we know? Well, first of all, um, sorry, I need a beer column here. What I'm actually gonna do is here, put our tax allowable depreciation in here and just make it a little bit easier. So our tax allowable depreciation. So year one, oh, sorry. First of all, we have to start with our investment. Our investment was 70 million, if we remember. Then we have year one. Um, we have our tax allowable depreciation of 15%. And remember, this was on a reducing balance method. So it's it equals minus the 70 million by 0.15 or 15%, giving you a negative 10.5. Again, it looks a bit better if we tidy up this calculation. So maybe be consistent and use two decimal places. And then we have a balance. And again, you can just underline up here just to show that you've done a calculation. And then it's the 70 million plus the minus 10.5 giving you a balance. And then your year two, your tax allowable depreciation is still 15%. And again, what you can do is you can take down this calculation. If you copy that cal calculation and place it there, it will actually multiply the one above. So it's a consistent calculation in there. So you can just take this and multiply it by there. And then you have your year two, your year three, tax allowable depreciation of 15%. Again, you just copy that down. You have minus 7.59, leaving a balance of just under 43 million. And then your year four, which is your balancing allowance. 
and your balancing allowance is. Now, hopefully you're shouting what my balancing allowance is in this case. And see the way I've just done three years calculations by just copying down the formula. That's the benefit of, benefit of the spreadsheet and you should try and use that as much as possible. So what's my balancing allowance? Hopefully you're shouting out. It's not about the balancing allowance. It's really about what this balance should be. And we know this balance is 20 million. Why do we know this balance is 20 million? We'll have a look at the question. The very last line of the exhibit, it is anticipated that the plant and machinery will have a realizable value of 20 million at the end of the project. Even though that was included in the 42, it doesn't have a, a different impact on the cash flows. It does have an impact on the, on the tax and the realizable value. So therefore, therefore, the, the final balance or the balancing allowance is the 43 million plus 20 million. So we can just, we didn't go down far enough, so we just tie it up a bit. So our balancing allowance then is 22.99 million, because remember, that's a realizable value that you were provided with in the question. Okay. Now we can do a bit of our tax. Now, our tax are based on the years as well. So I would often just take this in order to do our cash flow or our, our tax account. Now, we don't have anything in year zero um, for tax, but um, I, it doesn't matter if you, if you use them. I just use the layout. So our cash flow before tax, we have already calculated our cash flow before tax. So we can go back up to our calculation. Our cash flow before tax is here. Obviously, there's nothing in year one. We can drag that across. And again, if you realize a little bit later that you've made a mistake up above in your cash flow and you fix your cash flow before it's tax, because you've linked it all together, because you've fed it in, it'll all update naturally. And again, we can do a little bit of tidying up with the with the decimal places. Now, our tax allowable depreciation, well, for year one, we have minus 10.5. Oh, I always start off with an equals in these ones. We start off with a minus 10.5. For year two, it's the 8.9. For year three, it's the 7.59. And for year four, it is your minus 22.99. So that's your tax allowable depreciation. Now we have our taxable well, cash flows are just one plus the other. So equals that plus that. So we have a negative 12.5 million in the first year, and we drag that across. Okay. And we can fold that. Then we have our tax, and our tax is at 20%. So calculating our tax number. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can do this in the year payable, or what I would do, because it's paid in the year after, what I would do in year two, I would say it's the 12.5 million multiplied by 0.2 or 20%. And then if you drag that over, you can calculate all the way across. So in the answers, for example, it tells you in year five, but by including year five in this, you can actually show exactly what year, and then you can link it to your calculation, your net present value calculation above. So if we go to year five, sorry, if we go, sorry, if we go to um, put your tax into your, um, calculation, you're going back up here where we were earlier in your taxation calculation. And when we look at tax here, it's in year two. And it's a negative tax, which means it's a positive cash flow. So we're going to start off this with a minus because we're getting a two and a half million right back because we have a taxable loss in year one of 12 and a half million. So we get two and a half million. So it's a positive tax of 2.5 million. And then what we can do then is just drag that across. 
So that's all linked. And again, back to my point earlier, if there's any changes in your calculation in your tax answer, and look, all of this is updated. So your present value calculation is updating the minute you put these numbers in. It's a much neater, much easier way, much quicker way of doing that. Now what we're gonna move on to is your, your calculation for your working capital. And again, we have all our years. So I'm just gonna calculate, I'm sorry. First of all, I'll just make sure that it's well labeled. So working two is working capital. I'm gonna bring these headings down because we're gonna be, even if, they're, even all, if all the years aren't relevant, just leave them blank. It makes absolutely no difference, but it's a much quicker way of actually doing it. Because we know we don't need working capital in year five, I think, for example, in this one. So what is required for our working capital? So we know we need 10 million. So look at the question. Substantial initial working capital of 10 million will be required at the start of year one. If it's required at the start of year one, it needs to be put in year zero. So it's there for the, for the first day. Okay, so we know we need 10 million. Again, we can just nicely format all these in advance because we're going to be doing some calculations. So we know we need 10 million in year one or year zero. Um, and so how much do we need to invest? We need to invest 10 million. Let me see, we have a question. Are we allowed to write short forms equal profit for interest and tax, profit after tax? Um, Jordan, if you have, yeah, I think <coughs> it's a mixture. I would say yes. Um, because they are using them. The tax level depreciation is very clear. You, what you don't do is you don't write short forms in your report, Jordan. But I think the way I've done TAD here, considering they've talked about tax level depreciation in the exhibits, I think that's perfectly fine. <coughs> Excuse me. I would avoid using short forms like TAD and PBIT in your report. So if you're writing, try and write them all in full. Um, but I think for from the point of view of the Excel spreadsheet, the way I'm doing them is fine. So using TAD is perfectly fine, perfectly valid. So what do we require in year one? We require 10. So how much do we have to invest? We have to invest 10. And why is that? Because, sorry, we don't require it in year zero. We require it in year 10. So we have to invest it at the end of year zero. Okay. Now, what is the requirement for the working capital for year two? So let's look at what's required. We require 10 in year one. And therefore, the rest of that one, subsequently working capital of 15% of sales revenue for that year will be required at the start of years two to four. Any remaining working capital will be released at the end. So 15% of sales revenue. So if we put an equals in here and go back up to our sales revenue and multiply that by 0.15. Did I get the, yeah. So, I should have been engaged in that. Yeah, got the wrong column there. So just make sure that it's the right one. I picked up the wrong one there. So I should be picking up year two sales because it's year two working capital. So it's 15% of 40 million. So I require 6 million. And then if I drag that across to the end of year four, I require 7.2 million in year three, and I require 8.64 million in year four. And that's because it's 15% of the changing sales revenue. Okay. Now I have invested 10 million at the end of year zero or on day, day zero in advance of year one. So that means I need working capital at the beginning of year two of 6 million. But at the beginning, but at the end of year one, I have currently invested 10 million of working capital. So I need to recoup a certain amount of cash flow. I need to recoup that, that working capital. So it's 6 million minus 10 million. So I had 10 million invested at the end of year one because I invested it in year zero, but I only needed 6 million for year two. So I get 
I get 4 million back. Okay. Again, if you drag that across, I had 6 million invested at the end of year two, but I need 7.2 now. So I need to add 1.22 because the sales are increasing. And again, at the beginning of year four, I needed 8.64. I had 7.2, so I need another 1.44. And then we are told that we recoup the working capital at the end of year four. So you just minus the year, sorry, equal minus the end of year four to make sure that you're recouping that. And that's all that's required for the working capital. Okay. So now you have all of your working capital calculated. So you go back up to your calculation. You go minus 10 million because we need, sorry, not the minus, you need to go equals. It's not quite worked the same way as Excel, so you need to get used to that. It's, you have to put equals first and then minus and the 10 million because you know that 10 million is a cash outflow. And then you just drag that all the way across. So you have your cash inflow because you're getting your 4 million back and so on. So now you have your net present value calculation completed. We get a present value of minus, just over minus 1 million. I think it's about 900,000 in the ACCA answer, but it's exactly the same. Don't worry about that. It's only because our calculation is more exact because we're using the spreadsheet and they haven't used the spreadsheet in the same way as calculating the answer. Okay. Now, so we have done Appendix 1, which is estimating the discount rate. We have done Appendix 2, which is the, the motor project, so assessing the present value of all of the cash flows. Now we have a few other things to do. So if you're in doubt, you can close that down and just reopen your word processor. See the way I keep just a little bit here, because at this stage you should know five exhibits, you have your word processor and spreadsheet. So a little bit out, because then you don't have to move things around. You can just click on the one you want. So what have we done here? We have estimated the discount rate. We have estimated net present value. And now we have to estimate the adjusted present value of the new project. OK? So let's go and do that. Then. Now, the adjusted present value, that was talked about in exhibit number four. So we can put exhibit number four up in the screen for us and we can start working on that. There's a question. Can I, re Ada, can I repeat the working capital part? Sure, of course. Okay. It, it does take a, it even took me when I was going to a number of weeks ago when it was released, took me a minute. Okay. So if we, let me open up the right exhibit again so you can see. So have a read of this, just this paragraph one more time. Sorry, the, the, that one, not the last one. Substantial initial working capital of 10 million will be required at the start of year one. So if it has to be there at the, 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 the day one of year one, Ada, you think about it, it has to be paid over or the cash outflow happens in year zero. So let's say year zero is today and year one begins tomorrow. It has to be in the bank account ready to be spent tomorrow. So you have to put it in today. Okay. And that amount is 10 million. So our first day that we need to invest on year zero is 10 million. Then we are told that the working capital for each year is 15% of sales revenue required for each of the start of the year, okay? So what we're saying here is that we have looked at the sales revenue in year two, and the sales revenue is year two is 40 million. We have multiplied that 40 million by 15% up here, and the 40 million by 15% is 6 million. So we are told that at the beginning of year two, our working capital is, should be 6 million that we have available, okay? It happens that we actually have working capital of 10 million available on the last day of year one right now, which means that we can reduce the working capital by the difference between 10 and 6 million. So we have 10 million in working capital, that reduces to 6 million. So therefore we have a cash inflow, we have a release of working capital of 4 million. Again, you've calculated each of these as 15% of your sales. So what happens in year three? Well, we are told at the beginning of year three, we are required to have 7.2 million of working capital. At the end of year two right now, we have working capital of 6 million. So therefore the 7.2 million 
minus the 6 million gives you the additional 1.2 million that we have to add at the last day of year two, if you look at it like that, in order to have available on the first day of year three. So that is a cash outflow because we have to increase our working capital by 1.2 million. And again, in year three to four, we have 7.2 million. 15% of sales is 8.6 million, and the difference is the 1.44. And then we are told in the last line of that paragraph, any remaining working capital will be released at the end of the project. So whatever working capital we had in year four, we're taking all of that back. That's all being released back into the calculation. So whatever it is, this was 8.64, so we're just minusing out that 8.64. So at the end of the year, the working capital is zero. Hopefully, does that help, Ada? If that doesn't, let me know and I can go through it again. Um, but again, it might just take later on because we're working on lots of things and I'm giving you so much information if you work through it like that. But that is the advantage of using the spreadsheet as well. Okay, so as we know, we're gonna get rid of this one. And the next part we're moving on to is Appendix 3. And what are we doing for Appendix 3? Well, Appendix 3, we're looking at the, uh, oh, sorry, it's that one. Why is this? So sometimes it'll go a little bit funny, and this might happen in your exam. Don't panic, just move from one cell to the other and go back. It'll be fine. It can be slightly temperamental sometimes. So what is Appendix 3? Well, Appendix 3, first of all, most importantly, is answering B, Part 3 of your requirements. So we've already done Part 1, we've already done Part 2, Part four of B is the report. So this is your last calculation. And what is this doing? This is the motor scooter adjusted present value. And again, based on the question earlier, I am using those acronyms and I have no, I feel very hard done by if the acronym got punished and it certainly wasn't. Okay, so the, motor, the adjusted present value for the motor scooter. The first thing we're gonna look at is issue costs. So what is the deal with issue costs? Well, issue costs which need to be paid are anticipated to be 3% of the gross finance. Gross finance. Issue costs are not allowable as a tax deductible expense. So first of all, what is the, and I just, even though I don't have anything in the narrative here, so you can put it in here, I like to keep the calculations away from the first, um, the first column if I can. They're neater later on in line with everything else. So because it's the gross event, remember, we're saying that it's three divided by 97. So 3% of the gross finance and the gross finance is the 97% we, really, we receive, okay? So three divided by 97 multiplied by 80 million. And that 80 million is the seventh, the original investment. Remember the original investment? It's 70 million plus the 10 million of working capital because we needed that on the very first day of year one. So that 80 million is actually the 70 million plus, plus the 10 million, okay? So it was an 80 million loan that we had to get, 10 million for working capital and 70% for the, for the initial investment. And again, if you go back up here to our net present value calculation, there's a 70 million investment and there's the working capital of 10 million and that's all in the last exhibit. None of that was required to be calculated. So again, our issue costs are 2.47 million. Now, a couple of things that you can do here, um, because it's maybe not very clear that this is in millions, you can put up, you can take one of these and copy these down if you wanted to and put that there. You can also, I have no problem just putting dollar millions beside that because it's a, or dollar million beside that because it's a one-off calculation. Um, it's no, it's whatever, you, I'd probably do that. I, I wouldn't be too, you're not going to, I know you can go in here and you can choose your currency and you can choose dollars and you can do all of that if you wish. Um, I'm just all about just simple speed and thinking about the examiner and that 2.4, uh, I think that's the quickest way of doing it. And then you can move on. You're not messing around with formats and trying to get it perfect. Okay. The next thing, because there's enough to be getting on with without worrying too much. I think what you're trying to do is communicate with the examiner here. And I think you very validly communicated with the examiner, no problem. So the annual interest payable. 
And again, what's our annual interest payable here? So again, we're starting off with our $80 million loan, okay? We are multiplying that by 0 0.03. What is the 0 0.03? Well, look in your, right beside you in your exhibit, it's the 4.8%, which is your risk-free rate, minus the 180 basis points or 1.8 because of subsidized loan. So it's the 180 million multiplied by the 3%, multiplied by 0.2, which is your tax rate, giving you, um, again, that's, a no, that's your 400 and that's 0 0.48. And again, you can use this and put dollar millions down here if you want, because it's 480,000. You can type in your full numbers, but I don't think that's useful. If you typed in 80 million and you used all the zeros, this is gonna come in more useful now in a few minutes when you're doing your calculations. So I think it's better doing it that way. Your present value of your interest payable, because remember we're doing an adjusted present value calculation. So first of all, we're starting with our 0 0.48 and we are multiplying that. And I have the numbers here now. So 4.212 4 minus 0 0.943. Now, again, I would recommend that you look at this a little bit later, um, but these are your present from your present value tables. So it's your annuity table um, for year five, less year one. Okay, so when you go to your present value tables later on, um, at the proposed interest rate, um, you can see the difference between, um, you can see the 4.212 and the 0 0.943. You should all be very familiar with your present value tables now, so you probably don't need me to go through them, um, but have a look at that later and you'll figure that part out. I, I don't want to get too bogged down in looking at tables right now. And again, the 1.59, change that. And again, you can just put your dollar millions. If you're uncomfortable in this, you can do all these calculations in this row or this column, and you can put your dollar millions in that one, but I'm certainly not uncomfortable with this. Okay, so that's our tax shield. Now, we've, now we have to calculate what's the benefit of the subsidized loan. Because obviously we're getting a significant benefit because of the, the discount that we're actually getting. And what's our, the present value of the benefit? So what's the present value of our benefit? Well, it's our 80 million equals. So it's our 80 million loan again. What are we doing with this 80 million loan? We are multiplying that by 0 0.3, 0 0.03, sorry, 3%. Um, and then we're also multiplying this by 3.465. And that 3.465, again, is taken directly from your annuity tables. So it's your four-year annuity rate, or it should be your four-year annuity rate, which is giving you 8.3 million. And that means that the present value of the tax shield, and importantly, this is the tax shield lost. So it's great to say that you're getting a discounted loan, but you're also losing that tax shield. And remember that the benefit of debt is you're losing the benefit of that tax shield. So again, the, the losing the benefit of the tax shield is the 80 million by the 0 0.03 again, which is, we're doing that again and again, multiplied by 0.2, which is the amount of tax. And then multiply that, remember, is the exact same that we did before by the 4.212 minus the 0, 0 0.943, and that is the annuity rate minus year one. And again, that gives us 1.57 million and we can do, okay. Now, finally, our adjusted present value. So what is our adjustment present value? Well, first of all, we are going to start off with our negative present value, okay? So we are getting 
one, minus 1.01, which is our negative present value. Again, it's really beneficial to link all these in together. And again, if you have, as you're checking it through earlier, what do we add next? Well, we add our issue costs. And our issue costs are again, another negative because it's a minus 2.5 million or 2.47 million. Okay. We are adding our present value of our interest payable. We are adding the present value of our loan benefit and we are taking away our tax shield loss. Uh, hopefully that calculation works out nicely to 4.83 and again. What's the important part of your adjusted present value? Just put these up in, the, in line with this. What's the important part of your adjusted present value? Well, your net present value is a negative and your adjusted present value is a positive. So that's obviously a clear discussion point. Got a question here. Can we use the risk-free rate 4.8% to calculate the present value of interest payable instead of the 6%? Um, no, because the 6% is what the company is paying at the moment. It's the normal borrowing rate. So any calculations, Lee, that the, the company would do would be based on 6%. If you use 4.8%, it's not the end of the world. You might lose half a mark, but uh, it certainly isn't something I'd spent minutes worrying about. But because you're given the normal borrowing rate of 6%, it's better using that. So that's all your calculations. Now, that might have, obviously it's taken a bit longer because we've been going through them step by step. But it's not actually that bad. You got a lot of marks for that. And again, if you think about what we're able to do, reusing this layout a number of times, linking all our numbers together, getting the spreadsheet to do hard, half the work. I never once used this. I never once used the calculator. I didn't use the calculator on, on that you're available with the exam, and I didn't use my own calculator. And what benefit is that? Is that the examiner can see every piece of logic I used. They can see every calculation I did. So let's imagine I got something wrong. Let's say this, I typed in 1.4 instead of 1.2 here. I obviously will lose a mark because I got that part wrong and it had an effect on the answer. Because I did everything else right, I won't lose all those marks. But if you did everything else with a calculator and just typed in the numbers, the examiner doesn't know that you understand the logic of where those numbers came from. But this examiner is saying, probably saying, he's not gonna lose much marks because in fairness, he's just a bit unlucky. He just made a typo, but he clearly knew what he was doing because he was linking this to the sales and that to the percentages and doing all of that right. And so the more that you do, and look how easy it was because all these calculations of, like when you look through the exhibit, you don't have to keep on typing in numbers and typing them again. You can just type in the calculation and you can make a real logic. And I think what it does, it allows you to turn the words in the exhibit nearly into a narrative in Excel. And I think it's a much nicer way of doing it. It definitely saves time. Um, with a bit of practice, you would comfortably do all these calculations in the time given in the exam much, much quicker than you ever would have done with pen and paper because you're using all of the information. You're reusing the layout. You're not constantly typing in one, two, three, four. Just use it over and over again. If the column is not used, it doesn't matter. You're not going to lose marks. In fact, the examiner will probably be quite impressed that you, you actually understand the spreadsheet enough that you're reusing it. Everything is linked. Everything is calculation. Let the spreadsheet do as much of the work as possible. The more work the spreadsheet does, the less work you have to do, the less work you have to do, the more time is available and the less time you use, okay? So again, don't worry too much. Anything that I have done here, I'm not taking any shortcuts. And that was the important thing about showing you the spreadsheet. I'm not taking any shortcuts to say, oh, in the exam, you should do this. And in the exam, you should do this approach. This is exactly how you do it in the exam. If I was doing the exam tomorrow, I would do everything acronyms, linking, bolding. I would even do this millions here. Uh, like the examiner might say, I wouldn't have done it that way, but they're not going, you're not going to lose marks for that. Clearly you wouldn't write in your report in the same way. There's no way I'd ever write $8.32 dollar millions in a report. 
but from the perspective of being able to follow through in a calculation, because remember, these are just appendices to your calculation. That's all they are. They are not the answer. They are not the report. If somebody wants to look through the report later on, they'll be able to follow it. Absolutely no problem. Okay. So now you're done. You're done with all your appendices. You're, you're done with all of your exhibits. Remember, you have five exhibits. You've addressed four of them, one in part A, three of them in part B. You know the fifth one is related to part C, so you're not even concerned about that right now. So now what's left is to write your report. Well, now you go back to your spreadsheet, or sorry, to your word processor. Okay, now, Clicking down through, we have one and two and three done. And now we have to remember it's prepare a report and we effectively have to address number four and give a summary of what we did in our appendices, okay? So what I'm going to do here is I'm gonna just do this piece by piece. So I have it already done in another document and I'm gonna cover it piece by piece and kind of show you um, layout and stuff like that, okay? So I'm going to show you, so I'm going to show you some quick writing and then I'm going to show you full answers and we'll go through it. So the first part, and I'll do this in sections, okay? So the first part that I have done here is now. So what are we doing here? We are doing a report to the board of directors of Ziki Company. Make it very clear and nice heading. Okay, now. What's next? Every report has to have an introduction. You talk about getting your easy professional marks. Every report has to get an easy introduction. Um, what are we going to do? Uh, so in this example, I've just, and I'll show you different examples of the report. I've actually just put in my planning points first. And like earlier, you'll expand them. So the introduction, uh, this report is giving you an evaluation of the new scooter project for Ziki Company. Um, please note that the assumptions made around adjusted present value and back to, I think it was a Jordan earlier, whoever asked the question earlier about the acronyms, I would say the assumptions made around adjusted present value, I would write, it, write them out full in your report, Jordan, don't worry about them in your appendices, it's more appropriate than the net present value methods. What you could do as an example is if you're writing it for the very first time, you can write adjusted present value here, and then if you put that in brackets afterwards, and any other time you mention adjusted present value or net present value, you can always use the acronym then. And that's even more professional, it looks really nice, and it covers up all bases. So I'm going to assess the assumptions made around the adjusted present value method and how it is, and it is, more, how it is more appropriate than the net present value method. That's your introduction. Two or three lines maximum. See the way I have the gaps again. I'm making, here's what I'm doing, here's what I'm doing. They're two separate points, so give them gaps. No bullet points ever, okay? Now, let's go to the next part of the report. Some important parts of the report. So first of all, the evaluation. Why are we doing an evaluation? Well, look here. Evaluate whether the project should be undertaken. So, what you can miss out on in these requirements is that you can concentrate on the bullet points and thinking, oh, the report has to do these two things. But it is evaluate whether the new project should be undertaken. And so in part four for your report, you actually have three separate requirements, evaluation, assumptions, and then which one is more appropriate, okay? So under this, we have our introduction. Then we're gonna put in our evaluation, okay? And again, happily just put in, just calling it evaluation is perfectly fine. Um, net present value on all equity finance is negative. Again, we have 1.1 because it's a more um, accurate number because, or 1.01, but again, you're just gonna be showing exactly what's there. And again, see the way appendix two, so I'm pointing out, if you're somebody reading this report and you'd like to delve into it a little bit more, dig into it a little bit more, I'm telling you exactly where to find it. And your examiner is getting so happy right now. Just that simple referencing. So as I was saying earlier, you never write a report in the spreadsheet. You never do calculations in the word processor. 
but your examiner is looking at these two and you're just giving them a roadmap on how. So your examiner looks at a report and go, negative 1.01 million, brilliant. Where's that calculation? Oh, look, they showed me. I can scroll down in the sheet and I can see it exactly there. When the impact of financing is included, it, the adjusted present value is 4.9 million. We're just going to update that to 4.8 because we have a more accurate, or you can use 4.83. It's up to you. Any more than two, two decimal places is a waste of time. So again, no matter how you label them here, it is always more, um, it is always more professional to do it that way. So your net present value and alone uh, just a present value. So the project should go ahead. Again, make your points. So the project should go ahead with the subsidized loan, but not without it, because without it, it's a negative 1 million, and with it, it's nearly a positive 4.8 million, or nearly a positive 5 million. But both numbers are marginal and can be impacted by a change in the variables, leading it to be no longer viable. As cash inflows appear later in the part of the project, it's adding to the uncertainty of the calculation. And we can see that. We can see that when we do the calculation. We are spending, this is certain because we're spending it today. But the majority of the money we're getting back, the 57 million through our sales, which is in four years time, the 42 million that we think we're gonna get back for the investment in four years time, there's a lot of danger with those, those numbers and that they mightn't actually turn out because they're further away. So there's a lot more certainty in what you're spending than versus what you're actually going to earn in the future. So that's your evaluation section. So you've done that first part. Now, the next part, we're gonna look at your assumptions because isn't that the next part of we've evaluated? Now discuss the assumptions made in the estimates above. So let's have a quick look at our assumptions. So again, have a very clear heading called assumptions. So think, think about it as a report. Your introduction, I've asked to provide an evaluation. Now I'm asked to talk about the assumptions. So what are my assumptions? Well, the assumptions made are discussed below or discussed as follows. In appendix one, Liu's and Sanway use acid betas are calculated by de-gearing each company's beta to eliminate the financial risk. The acid betas of both companies represent just the business risk element. So that's one, um, one of them. It is assumed that Sanway Yu's acid beta represents the business risk of the wind farm business, and Li Yu's represents the business risk of both the farm and the sector, the motor sector. From these, it is assumed the asset beta representing a suitable proxy for the business of the environmentally friendly motor scooters can be computed and used to estimate the all equity discount rate. Okay. So it's all assumed. In appendix two, it is assumed that all the input variables are known. And we just talked about that. It's right on screen now with certainty or reasonable accuracy. It's also assumed that these variables and the factors which determine the variables do not change in the future, right? So we haven't, we haven't made any adjustments for that. Uncertainty increases as the cash flows are further into the future and the majority of the, po the positive cash flows for the new project occur in year four. So all that's being done here, I've kind of gone, okay, well, I have some appendices here. Let's look at Appendix 1. What assumptions have I made in Appendix 1? Now we move on to Appendix 2. It's not even about what you remember from your books. You kind of go, oh, Appendix 2, what assumptions have I made? Oh, that's further out. Oh, what have I done about the tax? What have I done about cash flows? What have I done about the investment being worth 42 million? And certainly the most obvious one is that the variables are against us because we could be wrong about the major cash flows happening in year four, but we're probably unlikely to be inaccurate about the major cash flows required right now. Again, then we just go straight to appendix three because it then, so we look down to appendix three where we have the adjusted present value. In appendix three, it is assumed that the interest rates of the subsidized loan and the corporate tax rates remain unchanged for the period of the project. Yeah. So we're assuming the tax rate stays at 20%. 
The normal borrowing rate of 6% is used to determine the present value of the financing side, although the risk-free rate could also be used and this will give a higher adjusted present value. So again, to, sorry, I can't remember now who question just asked, um, Lee, so there's your question. So if you had used the adjusted present value, you can say, I used the adjusted present value, it was a little bit higher, but if I'd used the, the, the other one, it would have been lower. The only thing about using the six, the six was more conservative. So the six gave a lower adjusted present value and you probably always wanted to be on the slightly conservative side. But again, Lee, you would see there that you wouldn't be wrong. The debt capacity of Ziki could change as a result of undertaking the project. In the computations, data or debt beta is assumed to be zero, although in practice, corporate tax is not free of default risk. That's nice cherry on top, but I wouldn't worry about that one too much. So again, you're asked to look at the assumptions. You have three appendices. You just go through each one and go, what are the assumptions? What did I make an assumption of? What did I try and guess? What did I try and use? There you go. That's your assumption section done. So again, always refer back now. Discuss, discuss whether the adjusted present value method would be more appropriate than the conventional net present value method. Make a decision. That's what they're telling you now. Please make a decision. Never leave a strategic professional exam without a decision. So now we're gonna have a look at just, just a present value versus net present value. Now, these are the ACCA answers and they're good to go through from a teaching perspective. The amount of words and, and content in them, it's, not, it's definitely not what you would need to reproduce to do a really good answer on the day. You just want to get the main points from this. Okay. So the first one now is we are looking at with net present value, future cash flows are discounted using the average cost of capital or the discount rate, since the positive net present value will ensure that the minimum return of all Ziki's investors are met. However, the discount rate does not take into account one, the trading risk profile, or um, as I said, the project is a diversification, or two, the changing risk uh, profile as it'll be entirely financed by debt. With the new project, both these are changing and the adjusted present value takes both changes into account. So what we're saying is the adjusted present value is a more accurate calculation. Do we have to delete all the question copied into the word processor processor after we have answered it. Yes, Jordan, and I'll come to that at the very end and show you what how I would present it to the examiner, but the short answer, do we get penalized if you don't delete it? You will lose some professional marks. So, um, but I always do that at the very end when you're really sure that you're happy that it's done. But yeah, you're risking some professional marks to be quite honest by leaving them in, so you shouldn't leave them in. Um, so the next one, Furthermore, the adjusted present value method will provide significantly more information about the sources of value and about the different levels of risk applicable to different cash flows. And again, if you just took your appendices and if you've got this broadly right or you knew what you were talking about, you can kind of just describe what you've done. When using the average cost of capital as a discount rate to generate the net present value, it is not possible to tell where the project's value is generated from whether it's from undertaking the project or the change in capital structure. But we can tell that in the adjusted present value because we can see the changes with the tax shield and the capital structure moving to a debt format. It also assumes that all cash flows have the same risk profile and should therefore be discounted at the same rate. The adjusted present value method considers the risk elements separately and considers the cash inflows of each. And again, that's what we've just done. So it's just, very straightforward, you're just describing what you've done. Because if you can understand how to do this, just describe nearly your process and describe the difficulties in there. It also assigns a suitable cost of capital which is relevant to each cash flow, such as the ungeared cost of equity or and the cost of debt to the financing side. Adjusted present value does not normally take into account cost of financial distress, possibility of tax exhaustion and agency costs related to the use of debt. Okay, so we can and then finally, however, in Ziki again, look what we've done now. We've analyzed adjusted present value. We've talked a little bit about Ziki. 
are coming back around to Zeki again. However, in Zeki's case, none of these is likely to be an issue because it has only used equity financing previously, and therefore the impact is likely to be minimal. For these reasons, adjusted present value is the more appropriate method to use. So we have described the relationship between adjusted present value and net present value. We have talked about Zeki up here, and we have done full circle in this section and come back and made a conclusion for Zeki. Either professional marks are allocated for question one report only or looking at how we answer the paper as a whole. Oh, that's a tough one, Ada. Um, it really is for question one only, and it's for question one report. But I don't, human nature would say that, well, put it this way, forget about the professional marks. Okay. It's much easier for the examiner to mark your paper if you answer it, if you show it really well, if it's, if it's really easy to follow, if it's nicely laid out, which is effectively what you get professional marks for. We know it's all about the different reasons, but effectively laying out a report correctly gets you most of the professional marks, okay? And putting the right content in and, and doing all the referencing from your spreadsheet into your word processor. I think that's how you should answer every question because you're more likely to get higher marks than every other question because you're making it easier for your examiner to find the marks to give you. So yes, they're only for question one, but I think it's an invaluable way of approaching ACCA exams anyway, and that's the habit you should get into. Don't You should never go in and think, oh, professional marks are for question one. I'm going to work harder at making question one look better. That's completely the wrong approach. You should be looking to be professional all the way through. Um, where are we going now? Okay, now, what are the last things that we would do? Finally, we have to finish the report. If you have an introduction, you have a conclusion. So what's our conclusion? After considering the assumptions made in the calculations and discussing why APV is the more appropriate method, the recommendation as a new project is undertaking, undertaken because it generates a positive adjusted present value. However, sensitivity and scenario analysis should be undertaken because of the assumptions made and because the decision to accept is marginal. And then you do a nice report compiled by and you don't even have to put your name in. You can just leave a blank or you can put Joe Smith or you can write your name in and put the date and put the date of your exam. So we're going to put the 20th of February, 2022. And there you go. So you talk about your professional marks, simply putting the, 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 the heading in for the board of directors, the introduction, the evaluation, and making your assumptions clear, having your paragraph breaks, like just even simply saying in appendix one, talking about your assumptions in appendix two, breaking it down up above here, sorry, where we said, oh, the equity finance is negative 1.01 million. The fact that you're giving a clear map from your word processor into your spreadsheet, that's really what you're getting your professional marks for. And I honestly believe maybe every single number you calculate in here won't be perfect. And remember, if this number was wrong, but you used it as part of your commentary, and let's say this number was a positive 5 million, and you used that as part of your commentary, but you actually talked about the 5 million correctly, you will get the marks. So you don't get double penalized. So don't be thinking that if I didn't calculate it properly, all my work is wasted. It is by no means wasted, not at all. It is the value of being able to write a report is based on your calculations. If not all of your calculations are right, you won't lose all of the marks for your report. You're still gonna get all the reports for your calculations. At the end of the day, a lot of your comments about the assumptions are still valid because you're talking about the assumptions, not about the numbers. A lot of your comments about adjusted present value or net present value are still valid because it, didn't, it wasn't based on the numbers. And even your final conclusion, if your final conclusion was correct based on the numbers you use, you will still get the marks. So never panic, never go, oh, my calculations are completely wrong. Just do them as best as you can. 
in the time allowed, and then do your report and you'll be fine. Okay. We are running, not that we're, well, we are running out of time, and I'm sure this is a lot to take in. So um, I'm not going to do part C because part C was the same as part A. What I will concentrate on is how you will present your answer to the examiner as asked. So what am I removing here? I am removing all of this. You take out your requirement and you take out anything that you've copied in from um, the exhibit. So you just leave your information. Part A was on post completion audits and the discount rate in project finance. Again, part B, you do a, before you delete them, do a quick check. Did I do a report for the board of directors? Yes. Did I estimate an appropriate discount rate and determine the net present value? Yes. Did I estimate the net present value of the new project? Yes. Did I estimate the adjusted present value? Yes. Did I evaluate whether it should be undertaken? Yes. Did I discuss the assumptions? Yes, I did. And did I discuss whether APV is better than MPV? Yes, I did. And I would hope I got all four of these because I did a really nice report. So you can get rid of all of this. Obviously you're gonna leave part B because the examiner needs to know what section you covered because it's all in one word processor. So your part A is there. Then you have your part B, just to report to the board of directors. You don't need anything else. You don't need to say, oh, my workings are in, it, in the word, in the spreadsheet, because that's all covered in your appendix too. You have written up here appendices. The examiner will open up your spreadsheet. They will open up your work, word processor at the same time. You have your assumptions and you have your date. And then similarly down here, part C is a very theory-based question, so you can have a look at that later. Um, and then compare and contrast. And then obviously you'll have, um, you'll have your answer put in under there. So you'll take all of this out um, after you've gone through it all. And then you just have your answer under part C. So the only thing that the examiner will see in your word processor and your spreadsheet is all of the work you have created. And what you need to do is anything that you have copied in for reference to do with the exhibits, um, or to do with the requirements needs to get removed. It is not the end of the world. If it's not, it would reflect badly on your professional marks. But again, if, if put it this way, if it's a difference between spending a couple of more minutes answering part C, let's say in this case, and you knew all the answers or deleting the sections, I would answer part C. You'll get more marks than you'll lose. But I do think it's an important part of your time management you only need to keep 60 seconds free at the end of each of your answers to go back and make sure that you format it properly. And I'm not too sure you'll achieve, do anything else better in 60 seconds than making your answers look really professional and really well laid out. So I would think it's, it's one of those things you should make time for. But that is what's really important when it gets to doing your practice. So I go all the way full circle and maybe, maybe three and a half hours or a bit more seems a long time ago now, um, late in your evening, only early in my morning. Um, and maybe it seems a long time ago, but think about all of the things that I raised earlier about time management, about practicing using these templates. Like that is key about keeping the language simple. Like some of this language is the ACCA language. You could even break it down even more. Like that's the most you'd ever write, but I'd probably write two thirds of that content in an exam. Um, some of these things are a little bit overwritten, just get the point across and move on. But it is, somebody asked me that question earlier, is it that simple? What else do you have to think about it? It's kind of that simple. There's nothing, I, what I would say about part B here is there's nothing really theoretically hard. They haven't asked you to explain anything. And the danger is, I know there's going to be so many people who would have done the exam in December and they would have written lots of net present value and lots of adjusted present value and provided all this theory. But realistically, everything you write in the report, why is it important to Ziki? If it's not important or relevant, and look at your requirements, they told you everything that's relevant. Evaluate whether the new project should undertake it. So let's imagine, so you have what, five or six things to answer here, okay? You should not be answering anything else. 
should not, you're not impressing the examiner. Remember we talked about that, they can't give you any more marks. So keep it simple, keep it straightforward. You are not looking, well, maybe you are looking to get 98%. And if you do, brilliant and congratulations. But you are looking to do a really good answer that the examiner has no choice but to pass you in your exam, okay? The best way to do that is to answer the exact question that was asked in the exact time that was given, okay? And again, similarly, if we just move on quickly, if we have a look at question two in section B, again, I would highly recommend you go in to, to test reach and you practice this paper and then you mark it and then you practice it again. It's no hard, like it's not about, as I said earlier, this is about getting, providing feedback to yourself on your layout, on your time management, on your structure, on your logic. It's not about whether you know the answers to everything. So if you look at the, the requirements for question two, and as I mentioned earlier, you're probably feeling a little bit weary now. And that's why I think you're better off doing question one now, because at least you're changing and 25 marks doesn't seem like such a big undertaking compared to 50 marks. So look at this. These are the requirements for part A, or sorry, question two. And again, I would open up my word processor, I would copy my requirements in, all that type of thing. So explain how functional areas of the treasury department could add value to structuring plans. And for each functional area, discuss the advantages of a centralized treasury department. So if you go into the, into, to the requirement, again, you'll see information about the different functional areas. So how functional areas could add value. And for each functional area, discuss the advantages. So you could already, without even looking at the exhibits, go into your word processor and have headings and kind of go, okay, how functional areas could add value. And then the advantages of each of the functional areas. And then you could do a section on each of the functional areas and write about them each. Seven marks. So that's one or two good points on each one and move on. Recommend a hedging strategy for 36 million loan based on the hedging choices. And if the central bank increases their rates to 6.6%. So that's a, that's a hedging question, okay? Important, up to four marks are available for discussion. So think about that. Part B is worth 15 marks, up to four marks. So what the examiner is saying, no matter what you write, you will not get any more than four marks for your discussion part. So your calculation part is worth 11 marks, which means that you should be spending about 75% of the time on this question doing the calculation and about 25% doing the, the description, the discussion. That means you don't have to go into a long-winded description of hedging strategies or I think this is, a, this is about FRAS or forward rate agreements, as far as I remember. You don't have to do all of that. You don't have to go near that. You don't have to explain what a forward rate agreement is. You want to recommend the strategy. Well, this strategy is this, and it's this because I've done these calculations and I can prove this is the best strategy. It's the cheapest one, it's a better long-term, it's a better for the company, it ties in with their hedging strategy, whatever it is that you'd be provided in the exhibit. Okay, again, look what the examiner is saying to you. Briefly explain. Three marks, five minutes, two to three good points, and you've got two and a half marks, and off you go. Move on. Briefly explain. Okay, what is meant by smoothing and how this technique could be used? So you have to answer two requirements. What is meant by smoothing and how it can be used to manage brand and companies, not every company's, Brand and company's interest rate risk. So you write one good answer here, one good paragraph here, one good paragraph here, and you move on. Look what the examiner is telling you. Briefly explain. Don't spend too much talking about discussion because you'd only get four marks. You're wasting your time. So if you think in here, again, it's back to my question earlier, about half the marks in this question are for discussion and half the marks are for calculation. And if you balance them right, it'll work out really well. And then just to quickly 
Part three again, if you look at that, calculate the expected sales price and demonstrate its impact on Hanwood. Remember, apply your knowledge to the scenario. If you can just remember that, and, and I know somebody said earlier, oh, that sounds simple. What else do we do? That's all that you do. Okay. But that just won't happen. So I'm going to move out of this now and, and come back and basically say goodbye now. Um, and if you have any questions, if you have any last minute questions, please put them into the chat. But it's not that more, not as difficult as it looks. Okay. And I know it's one thing sitting here looking at me and it's fine. I have the answer and I've had plenty of time to get ready and, and I get that. But you have plenty of time to get ready. You now have a two and a half weeks to get ready for your exam. Okay. You can decide to do it in a way. Um, you can decide to do it in your current way. And if you're doing exactly the same way I'm doing, but if you want to pass, you want to make sure you pass the advice I've given you today, the advice your examiners are giving you, like don't ignore that. Don't decide, well, that was all great, but I'm going to do it my way. That's fine, but that's not how they're looking at you. They're, they, they have decided a way, they wrote the exam, they've written the answers, they have decided how they want to be presented to, and they're telling people how they want to be presented to. And being honest, if you don't listen to that, it's kind of your loss. And I don't mean that, that's not a negative thing. And you might have different opinions and different views, but at the end of the day, you have to do it in a way to maximize your marks. And that means doing it in a way that the examiners are happy with and comfortable with. Okay. And following my advice today, if you stick with that, and it'll be hard if you're doing things in a different way, it'll be hard to adjust. But what won't work is having a plan on exam day and not practicing between now and then, all your practicing should be based on how we did today. I think there's some question. Um, so from, sorry, just catching up. Which, oh, um, professional marks are, oh, done that one. Sorry, Ada. Andrew, um, at this stage of preparation, would you recommend covering as many past papers as possible or reinforcing just a handful of them over until you fully grasp them? Great question, Andrew. Um, a handful and reinforced them. So the December, September, December 2021 paper has just been released. So they release two every year. So I would say you probably shouldn't go back any further than the last four papers. And I think if you read the examiner reports, they actually say the last three to four um, because they do change and the requirements change and the way they write the question changes. So if you go any further back than that is not really an indication. And I would make sure you can do those four papers really well. And, and it will be hard at the beginning because you'll do a question, you'll compare to the answer, you'll figure out where you went wrong, you'll put everything again away again, you'll start with a blank piece of paper, you'll get closer, but you mightn't get it all right, or you mightn't get the time management right. And you, this is where you work hard. This is where, if anybody's involved in sports, this is their hard training to make the day of the race easier, to give you the best chance of winning. But the training is often harder than the racing. And that's something that you have to do. This is the hard part. This is the frustrating part. This is the part where you're not getting any rewards today, but your reward will come an exam day and you kind of think, wow, this wasn't bad. Actually, I'm quite happy with that. So yes, Andrew, I would say covering um, no more than the last four sets of papers, but covering them really well, really, really well. Um, no problem, Stephanie, you're welcome. Um, I'm glad that helped. So I did. I do hope everything helped today. Um, I'm sure a, video, a copy of this video will be made available. Um, you might have been told this already and I missed it, but a copy of the video will be made available. And I would check back on this. And, and again, if you're in doubt about it, but remember, keep it simple. That's all it is. Keep it simple. Keep it a very simple. Remember all the knowledge, all the questions, everything like that. How to pass an exam is to communicate effectively with your examiner, with the person giving you marks, making it as easy and as clear for them to say, there's a mark, there's a mark, there's a mark. Look at all these paragraphs. This is so easy. Just brilliant point, 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 point. This makes my life so much easier. This student clearly, 
clearly worked hard. Because when it comes down to kind of the examiner reading something that you've written and you kind of go, the examiner is going, well, I could look at that one of two ways. If it's a case that the examiner is following your exam really well and is really well presented and you've communicated, you've put your best foot forward all the time, you'll probably get the benefit of the doubt. But if it's badly organized and you're not answering questions well and you're not answering what you've been asked, the examiner go, well, there's no reason to give them the benefit of the doubt because they haven't earned it and they haven't proven they deserve it. But for those 50-50 where examiner is going to go, well, Alan wrote this and he could have meant this or he might have meant this. Well, if you've written, if you've communicated really well with the examiner, if you've done exactly what you're supposed, what they've asked you to do, well, those 50-50 calls are more than likely going to go in your favor and not against you. And that's the way. It's remember, you don't start an exam with 100 marks and lose marks. You start an exam with zero and you build up. So every mark you get, every tick you get from the examiner, every one and a half out of two, every four out of five, every three and a half, every four marks you get for professional marks, and you've been professional all the way through. That's what's getting you to 50. It's not the big, I got a calculation right, I got 16 marks. That's not what will actually get you passing. What will get you passing is getting three out of five in part one and five out of seven in part two. And all of those just so, consi that consistency adds up. And that's what makes you comfortably pass. So I hope that really helped today. Um, and I do thank you for all your attention. And I know, but if you, if you consider this, this is the effort required in the exam. It's a pretty, it's a little bit longer, but it's a pretty similar time. And again, going back to Andrew's point, um, concentrating the last three or four papers, know them really well, perform them really well, understand them really well, practice using templates all of the time and have your exam strategy ready. And I'm sure you will do all very well. So all the best. And um, thank you, ACCA Malaysia. Yes, I hope you feel more confident and I'm glad that helped. It's your second, if it's your second attempt, Stephanie, hopefully today showed you something different that you didn't do before and, and that you can make an adjustment. Then again, if it is your second attempt, I'm hoping that today you saw something that, oh, if I had done, I didn't do that the last time. And anything that you saw today that you know that I never did that before, make sure to do that in the future and you'll be fine. Great choice of jacket too. You're, you're welcome, Victor. I have to say at 6 a.m. this morning, Victor, I wasn't giving it too much thought. But anyway, I wish you the best of luck and um, all the best in your exams. I'm sure you'll do fine. And I will hopefully never talk to you at another one of these for AFM again in the nicest possible way. So all the best. <laughs>